Hi, in part 1 of this course, you will learn how to download and install VirtualBox on Windows 10. Then I'll demonstrate the installation process for RHEL server. Next, we will talk about terminal. What is terminal and how to open terminal. Then we connect to a RHEL server using SSH. In the end, you will find summary of part 1 and that's all. To download VirtualBox, open your browser and type download space VirtualBox. Open the first link and select Windows Host. If you are using Windows as operating system or select Linux or Mac if you are using it as your main operating system. And as you click on Windows Host, it starts downloading automatically. For now, I am cancelling this because I already have same VirtualBox setup. Now let's talk about installation of VirtualBox. We have recently downloaded. Go to setup file, it is generally found in downloads folder and double click to start installation. Further process remains same like any other software installation. Click on next, next and finish and that's it. Now if you want to download Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.3 then either you can create account with redhat.com and then access to a free 30 day evaluation version or you can follow the link which I have mentioned in a text file which is attached with this lecture. In this lecture, I will demonstrate how to install Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 7.3. I have just booted my virtual machine from RHEL 7 ISO file, which I have downloaded earlier. And as you can see here, the default options that are presented from the boot menu of ISO file or you can say from the boot menu of installation media. By default, it selects the second option, test this media and install Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 7.3. And testing the media takes a lot of time. So normally you have to use install Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.3. And there is third option which is for troubleshooting, which provides you some advanced installation options. You can choose it when you are unable to install RHEL server normally. But for now, I select first option. Now this takes a while for my system to get started and when the installation program has been loaded, it's gonna ask you some questions. As you can see here on your screen, the first question is to select what language you want to use during the installation process. In this course, I am using English language with an English keyboard. So I am going to select English English and click on continue. Please ignore the watermark for activate windows. Next, there is installation summary. There are various options available, but we have to care for some of them like software selection, which is by default goes for minimal installation. Minimal installation is fine, but you will not get much out of it and graphical user interface is also unavailable in this option. So we have to change it from minimal installation to server with GUI. Yes, I know that real servers running in data centers won't have a GUI. But to make you familiar with Linux, we have to use this option. It is very convenient for you. So let's select this option and click on done. Now you have to wait a while until the program updates. And next we have to check installation source, which is set to local media, which is good. Now you have to specify where you want to install rel server. And as you can see here, it has selected the option itself, which is fine for me. I don't want to change partition right now. So simply click done. At last, you will find network and host name, which shows you that by default, you are not connected to any network. So we have to switch it on and you can see we now have an IP address and other related information. Of course, we can change it, but we will do it later in this course. Have a look on host name below. From here, you can assign host name to this virtual machine. A full fledged host name includes DNS, and I am using example.com as my default domain name. So, rel7.example.com is my host name, and click on done. Now, to begin installation, I have to click begin installation button. As you can see, the system starts installing packages. But there are two things you have to take care of. First is root password. 
I hope you will know that root is same as administrator user in Windows, which means root has all the power to do all changes to a rel server. For now, I am using simple password like Red Hat. But in real environment, you must use strong passwords, which are difficult to guess. You will see a warning below saying the password you have provided is weak. So to continue, you have to double click on done. It is necessary to create another user here because you don't like to be working as a root all the time on server. So I am creating a user Shubham, which is my name and assign a simple password like 1234 and again 1234 and double click on done. System is still installing the packages and it will take around 10 to 12 minutes to complete. I have to pause this video for now and I will resume it when the process gets completed. Now it's time to reboot your virtual machine on reboot and it will start rebooting. After reboot you will see this option license information and it is telling you to accept license agreement type 1 and press enter. Then type 2 and again press enter. Type Q and hit enter. Now it is asking yes or no. Type yes and hit enter to continue. You have completed all your process and your system now shows you the login screen. From here you can log in by typing the correct password for user Shubham which is 1234 in this case and click on signing in or hit enter to continue. Now your system loads up and shows you the desktop environment. Here we go. It is asking you some questions. It is so because it is the first time we are logging to this new system. All you have to do is click on next, next, skip and click on start using rel server and here you can see your genome help or you can call it as gnome helper. You can watch videos by clicking on it but for now I have to skip it. So that's it for this tutorial. Hope to see you in next lecture. Let's talk about terminal. You can say terminal is an interface between user and system because we use a language which your computer won't understand. So it is terminal which takes command from user and convert it into machine language for further operations and then takes output from your system and shows you in a human readable format. Therefore, we can say that terminal is a medium of communication between you and your system. There are three ways to open a terminal. First and most easiest way is to right click and select open terminal. Second option is press window key from keyboard and type terminal. Then press enter to open the terminal. Else go to applications which is situated at the top left corner. Select utilities and inside utilities you will find terminal. Now. If you are watching terminal for the first time, then you won't understand what's written in it. So the first word inside the bracket is the username from which you are currently logged in, like username Shubham in this case. Then you will find at the rate rel7, which means rel7 is your host name. If you want to know your host name with domain name, just type command host name and hit enter. I hope you remember this host name. It is the same which I have assigned at the time of installation. If you move forward, you will find tilde. Tilde represents the home directory of a user, which also represents your current directory. If you want to cross check, run command pwd, which stands for print working directory or present working directory. So we are in slash home slash shubham in this path. The first slash represent the main directory which I will explain in upcoming lectures and the second slash represents 
that home directory contains another directory named like shubham in this case you don't have to worry about directory structure because i'll explain it in a separate lecture ssh stands for secure shell it is an important utility for getting remote access to an computer system in a secure way let's say you are an linux engineer sitting on your company server there are hundreds of clients running in the same company but at different floors and suddenly you received a complaint about one of your client on second floor and you are sitting at first floor so you don't have to physically visit that computer system you can access via ssh utility by sitting at your location it's just a small example of ssh let's do a practical i am using ssh followed by host name localhost i know it's a kind of weird example but it makes you clear about how ssh works as i press enter it's asking me for are you sure you want to connect type yes and hit enter this allows me to connect to my own system which i am currently using if you watch carefully i am receiving a fingerprint you will receive this kind of fingerprint when you try to connect to a server for the first time because fingerprint act as a identifier for a system it stores in a file locally on your system to make sure that nothing has changed since last time you had logged in then it ask for password which password well for the user account from which i have currently logged in that is password for root user now i am in my ssh session type exit to end this session now i also have other server installed on my pc actually i don't tell you before that i had two virtual machines installed in virtual box both are running rel 7.3 and both have same class of ip address for smooth communication the server i am using is rel 7 and the server which i want to connect is rel 2 so ssh parik at the rate 10.0.2.16 there is a file which stores the fingerprint so let's have a look on it cat space dot ssh slash known host cat command is used to view matter of a file in read only format so here is your key and that's all do you know that typing password each time you use ssh is kind of a risky and time consuming process risky because there are chances that someone might guess or crack your password so to prevent it we have an option of ssh keys let's do it ssh hyphen key gen to generate a rsa key pair now it asking me for a file to save the key which is by default in my home directory and sub directory with a name id underscore rsa and it's a private key as it is a private key so now it's asking for a password to protect it if you assign the password it will ask you to enter this password whenever you try to use this key it is very secure and useful but for now as i am using it only for teaching purpose i don't need to do it so i am pressing enter and enter and the result is that your key is now created id underscore rsa is my private key and id underscore rsa dot pub is my public key which i need to copy over server so we have to use a command ssh hyphen copy hyphen id followed by name or ip of the server now it ask me password of remote user and that's it now if i try to connect to a server that is rel2 in this case it won't ask me for a password that's it for ssh because as a beginner you don't have to go deep inside ssh so you have learned how to install rel server on your virtual machine and how to connect to it using ssh with or without password you have also learned what terminal is and many different ways to open it
Hi, this is part two, basic management task. In this part, you will learn about Vim text editor, Linux directory structure, working with files, user and group management, managing permissions and processes. At last, you will find summary of part two of this course. Vim stands for VI improved and it is a very important utility because everything is stored as text files in Linux. Although there are many text editors available, but Vim is most useful among all of them. So as you start Vim, you might think that you can start typing text in a file, but you don't because after starting Vim, you get into command mode and command mode is for typing commands. So if you want to start typing text, you must get into insert mode or you can say input mode. You can get into insert mode by using A or I or O or insert button from your keyboard. A stands for append, I stands for insert, O is to open a new line and insert key is same as I. After getting into insert mode, you can type whatever you want and then you need to get back to command mode by pressing escape key. After pressing escape key, you need to type colon followed by wq and exclamation mark. There is no particular reason behind using colon, but yes, w stands for write and q stands for quit. And exclamation mark is to force the system that don't ask me anything and just do it. Well, wq is same as save and exit feature in Windows. Now let's do a practical of Vim. Let's say you want to create a file with a name student in your home directory. So Vim space tilde slash student. Well, I hope you remember that tilde represents the home directory of your current user. Now you are in command mode. If you see below, you will find the name of your file. And here it specifies the current location of your cursor. And in the last, it specifies that you can see all of the file right now. As you know that you can use I to get into insert mode, so press I. And you can see in the lower left part of the file, which shows that you are in insert mode. Type here some text as it is a student file. I can type student's name here, like Harry, Tom, Martin. John, ABC, XYZ, etc, etc. But remember, it doesn't make any sense. You can type whatever you want. Now save your file. Open it again. And let's try some commands here. Like DD. Now the line where my cursor is blinking before has been disappeared. Well, it doesn't gone. Sorry. It does gone in buffer memory from which I can get it back by pressing P. If you want to undo some changes, you can use U. You can use R for recover or redo some changes. You can also use YY to copy a line where your cursor is placed currently. Or if you want to copy multiple lines, let's say three lines at a time. You can use 3YY. Take your cursor where you want to paste it and press P for paste. You can do something else like colon percent S slash old text like Tom slash some new text like Bob slash G. It can change Tom into Bob. Well, if Tom is written multiple times in this file, it can replace it with Bob at all locations in the same file. It is because we have used G at the last of command and G stands for global. Now, if you want to find some text in a file, simply use slash and type whatever text you want to find. If there are couple of text or words matches with the, your text, then you can use N to move from one to another text. There are some short keys you can use here like use gg to go to top of the document. 
use g to go to last line of the file if you want to go to the last of a line press dollar and if you want to go to the beginning of a line press caret well there are so much you can do with vim you can see all available options by using vim space hyphen hyphen help but i have provided sufficient information about vim specially for beginners so that's it for this tutorial this is how your linux directory structure looks like let's see how you can use them everything is begin in your system is by this directory this root folder contains all your hard drives and usb drives and other folders you cannot go above this directory this directory is represented by slash well it is little difficult for windows user because there is no hard drive like c drive d drive e drive etc instead you will find all the matter in linux is stored in folders but don't worry after watching this tutorial you will find how useful this directory structure is first we will see slash bin folder which contains binaries files here are not in text format which makes system to execute them faster it contains programs that are essential for a system to boot and run if you destroy this folder your system fails to boot and run you cannot open and read the contents of these programs then there is slash boot folder as the name suggest this folder needs to boot your system this folder contains the linux kernel initial ram disk image and grub grub is a bootloader in linux and then there is slash dev folder as you know everything is a file and this folder contains files for all devices if you have used linux earlier you may remember that when you mount a hard drive you can use a name like slash /dev slash /sda1 and sda is the name of first hard drive which your kernel recognized and it is located in the dev folder and once a disk is mounted you see it as a folder the slash /etc folder contains all the configuration files and some shell scripts that are executed during the system boot all files here are text files so they are human readable slash /home directory contains the home folder for each user in the linux system and the home folder of each user is named same as its username like if you create a user named bob then you will find its home directory as slash home slash bob in slash home slash bob user bob can store his personal data or pictures or documents etc if you log in to your system as user bob and open a terminal you will find that your default location is set to slash home slash bob then there is slash lib directory lib stands for libraries these libraries are used by programs situated in slash bin directory and a library is a set of functions that are shared between programs this folder is also very important for your system to work correctly then you will have slash lost plus found directory you will find it if you will have ext4 file system it is used in case of data recovery then we have slash media it is used for auto mounting of removable media for example if you plugged in your usb drive or cd drive it will be automatically mounted in slash media then there is slash mnt it is same as slash media but it is used for manual mounting instead of auto mounting slash opt is for optional software and it is not essential slash proc is maintained by linux kernel usually a user cannot touch anything in this folder it is used by kernel to run different processes slash root is the home directory of root user don't get confused with slash directory slash and slash root are two different things slash is parental directory for all these directories and slash root is the home directory of a user root if you are working as root then slash root is set to your default directory 
slash run is a temporary file system and is recently introduced. Slash asbin is similar to slash bin directory which contains system binaries but they are to be run by super user that is your root. Slash SRV contains service files installed on your system. For example, if you install a web server, it will be located in this folder. Slash temp is used by programs to store temporary files. This directory usually cleaned on reboot. Slash USR is probably the largest folder after slash home folder. It contains all programs used by a regular user and slash where contains variable files. These files are not static and are constantly changes. For example, log files which are situated under slash where folder. Well, log files is a file that records all events happening in your system while it is running. I hope this directory structure is now clear to you. Creating files in Linux is a very easy process. There are various commands available for it. Our first command is cat command which stands for concatenate. Yes, I know that in the previous lecture I told you that cat command is used to view matter of a file in read only format. But you can also create files using the cat command. Like I am going to create a file with the name Harry. So cat space greater than space Harry. Enter file matter here like hi this is a sample file and to save a file press ctrl plus D. Now again use cat space Harry to view file matter. Well if you see here in cat greater than Harry cat is a command greater than is option and Harry is the name of file. Let's create another file cat space greater than space bob. Enter file matter. Whatever I am typing doesn't make any sense. And save it. You can also use cat command to view contents of multiple files in terminal as well. Cat space Harry space Bob. You can also use cat to display line numbers in file like cat space hyphen n space Bob. There is so much you can do with cat but for now it is sufficient. Now there is another command touch. Touch command is used to create new empty files. The syntax for touch command is touch space option space file name. If you don't want to use any option that's okay. Let's say you want to create three files file 1, file 2 and file 3. Then either you can use touch space file 1 enter then touch space file 2 enter then touch space file 3 or you can use touch space file 1 space file 2 space file 3 and that's it. It means you can create multiple blank files using touch. Then there is another command vim. I hope you all now know about vim. So let's not repeat that and move forward to head and tell commands. Head command reads the first 10 lines of any given file name. Well, why I mentioned first 10 lines here? Because if you use head command without any option, it will read first 10 lines by default. Yes, you can specify any number of lines you want to view. Let's say you want to view first 5 lines of a file slash etc slash passwd. Don't think about passwd file for now. I will cover it in upcoming lectures. So, <coughs> head space hyphen n 5 slash etc slash passwd. n stands for number of lines. But hey, it is not mandatory to use hyphen n. You can use or you can also get same output by using head space 
hyphen five space slash etc slash pass wd. There are other options available to use with head command like option hyphen c. Using hyphen c option followed by the number of bytes will show you any desired number of bytes of a file. Let's clear it by using an example. Suppose you want to view first 40 bytes of slash etc slash pass wd file. So head space hyphen c 40 slash etc slash pass wd. Our next command is tail command. Tail command is just opposite of head. Tail command allows you to display last 10 lines of any text file. Although they are different from each other but they use a similar options like hyphen n. You can use hyphen n with tail command as well. Let's say you want to view last six lines of slash tc slash pass wd file. So we use tail space hyphen n six slash etc slash pass wd. Next command is wc. It is used to count words characters and lines of a file like wc space hyphen l space bob it shows you the number of lines in a file bob use wc space hyphen w space bob to print number of words and use wc hyphen c bob to count number of bytes and wc space hyphen m space bob to count number of characters and wc space hyphen capital L space bob to print only the length of the longest line in the file. Use wc without any option like wc space bob and it will show you number of lines, number of words and number of bytes together. Our next command is cp command. It is used to copy files and directory. Like if I want to copy a file bob to slash etc folder then I type cp space bob space slash etc and if I want to copy same file in the slash etc but this time with a new name so I use cp space bob space slash etc slash tom. And if I want to copy a folder, first I create a folder mkdir space test and now cp space hyphen r space test space slash etc. Yes, you have to use hyphen r if you want to copy a directory. What if you want to move a file or directory? Well, for that we have mv command. Just use mv followed by file or folder name and specify the location and that's all. Suppose you want to rename a file or folder then simply use mv space file or folder name like test folder here and specify a new name like test1. And if you do ls to show the list of all available files and folders of our current directory you will find test1. You will not see test folder anymore. Our second last command for this tutorial is ll. It shows you details of all files and folders available in the present directory but with full details which are not possible by using ls command like what permissions are applied on files or folders, owner name, group name, size, date and time etc. And our last command is rm to remove files and empty folders. Because if the folder contains some data we have to use rm space hyphen r. Hyphen r stands for recursive and specify the directory name. And that's all. User accounts are very important in a Linux system. And user account is not just a person who wants to log in and use a system resources but it is also used by processes. Let's make it clear with an example. If you use ps space aux pipe 
less. You will see each running process is using a user account like root here. Now let's have a look at user properties. User properties are found in slash etc slash passwd file. So when you run cat space slash etc slash passwd, you will see this output. It is divided into seven columns. First column contains username. Second column contains password value. Well, the password is encrypted and is kept in a different file for security reasons. In the third column, you will find UID, that is unique identification number for each user. User root has generally UID zero. There are total of 64,000 UIDs that are available. Then there is a GID. In Linux, every user is a member of at least one group and that is the primary group or private group of the user. Primary group is automatically created when we create a new user. Let's say if we create a user John, then a primary group is created with the same name. By default, John is the only member of his primary group John. Then there is GCOS field or you can call it comment field. Suppose you are working as a system administrator for a big MNC and there are thousands of users with their user accounts. Then how will you know that which user is from sales department or which user is from production department? Well. You can specify all these in GCOS field. Like here, you will find that user rock is working for sales department. In the next column, you will find the home directory. Home directory is the location where a user can store all his data. At last, you will find default shell. Bash is the default shell. It is a program that automatically started when a user logged in. Bash stands for born again shell. There is a nice utility hyphen hyphen help. You can use it with any command to get a brief description about all the options available to use with that particular command. So user add space hyphen hyphen help user add or add user both are same and user add is the default command for creating a user here is a list of many options let's say you want to create a user tom and want to mention it in sales department so user add space hyphen c space sales department tom if you want to verify use get space slash etc slash passwd. Now there is another option that is hyphen e for expiration date but you will not find detailed information about it. So we use main page of user ad by typing main space user ad and search for hyphen e option by typing slash minus e and you can see the date format is specified here which you will not get in hyphen hyphen help. Suppose there is a user Daniel and he is a programmer and as a programmer he want to use tcsh. It is a shell that uses a C scripting language. So we type user add hyphen c IT department hyphen e 2018 10 05 hyphen s slash bin slash tcsh daniel. You can verify it by using cat space slash etc slash passwd. To set password for daniel, use passwd space daniel. It shows that you have assigned a bad password but I am root and root can do anything.
After watching part 1 and part 2 of user management, you now know about user properties, how to create a user and how to assign password. But that's not enough. In this video, we are going to do more with users. How to lock or unlock a user or its password and how to make a user the member of secondary group. Let's say one of your co-worker is on leave for a week. Then to maintain server security, you can lock its user account. To lock a user account, use user mode space hyphen L space username like Bob. And to unlock, use user mode space hyphen U Bob. Now, if you want Bob to be the member of sales group, group add space sales. Okay, we have it. Type user mode hyphen capital G capital G represents secondary group and then sales and Bob use ID space Bob to verify let's do something more use user mode space hyphen L Robin space Bob it will change account name of Bob into Robin you can create a user account with your desired UID. Use user ID space hyphen U space 2555 space Jerry to create a user Jerry with UID 2555. You can also change UID of existing users. For that, replace user ID with user mode. In last command and rest syntax remains same. Now let's try something else. For this practical, we have two users, Robin and Harry. Both are from same department and want to share their files. But by default, they are the only member of their private group. Like Robin is the only member of primary group Robin and the same with Harry. So, we can create a secondary group as a solution to this. Secondary groups are also called public group. Group add space sales. Make Bob and Harry the member of sales group. User add hyphen G sales Robin. And user add hyphen G sales Harry. Now there are three important files in Linux, passwd which you already know, then there is slash etc slash group file and slash etc slash shadow. So cat slash etc slash group. It stores group information or defines the user groups. That is it defines the groups to which user belong. There is one entry per line and each line looks like this one. All fields are separated by a colon. Where sales is your group name? Second column is for password. Generally password is not used. Hence it is empty. Then there is GID or group identification number. Each user must be assigned a group ID. Last column contains group list. It is a list of usernames of users who are members of the group. The usernames must be separated by commas. If you want to view GID of a group, use ID space hyphen capital G space sales capital G for secondary group and id space hyphen g harry is for primary group. Then there is shadow file. It contains password and account expiration information for users and looks like this. Same as passwd and group file, each field is separated with colon. First is username. It is case sensitive and usually all lowercase. Then there is password and is encrypted. 
then there is number of days since 1st January 1970 since the password was last changed then there are number of days before password may be changed and a zero here indicates that it may be changed at any time then there is number of days after which password must be changed 99999 indicates that user can keep his or her password unchanged for many many years next column specifies number of days to warn user of an expiring password it is set to 7 by default so your system warns you to change your password a week before it expires then there are number of days after password expires that account is disabled next column specifies the number of days since january 1 1970 then an account has been disabled and the last field is a reserved field for possible future use but last two columns won't show you any information and are not that important but getting extra knowledge won't hurt you if you are a user root you can manage password properties for your users to do that use passwd hyphen hyphen help there are some options available here like lock or unlock a password or expire a password also you can set maximum lifeline of a password and can set minimum lifetime of a password and specify warning days and many more then there is another command c h h and let's do hyphen hyphen help and you can see it gives you similar options you can do c h h hyphen l harry to get an overview of current settings for user harry now let's get back to password pass wd hyphen hyphen help and try to lock a password for user harry so pass wd hyphen l harry and you can see the locking was successful now what is exactly happened let's have a look at cat slash etc shadow file and look at user harry there is double excla exclamation mark in front of the encrypted password and that is what actually happens when you lock a password now if you want to unlock a password again use pass wd hyphen u harry so these are some examples but you can try all the options available to use with pass wd command by yourself this is part 1 of managing permissions in this part i will explain you what is ownership which includes user ownership group ownership and others ownership i am going to show you an example cd space slash home then ls space hyphen l so here is list of files and directories that exist in home folder this is home directory for user jerry and it has owner jerry and group owner that is group jerry now you can see that for every file and every directory there are permissions and the permissions are what i have highlighted here so permissions are specified in group of 3 so it starts with rwx which relates to the owner of the directory like jerry in this case then we have nothing nothing and nothing which is for the group and then we have nothing again three times which relates to others now it is users groups and others which is most important to understand in linux every file or directory has an owner the owner is the user and the user have specific permissions and every file has a group group owner and it has a specific permission as well and apart from users and groups there is others and others just means everything else which is not specifically mentioned here 
Now, let's understand how Linux determines what permissions a user have. Well, it first look if the user is the owner and if the user is the owner, the permissions are applied. If user is not the owner, then Linux will check if a user is the member of the group that is group owner of the file. And if it is true, the group permissions were applied. And if it is not a member, then permissions specified for the others will be applied. There is one more thing which is important. Linux follow a process while checking for permissions. Like it will first check whether a user is the owner of a file or directory. If it is, then it won't look further. And if it is isn't, then it look for whether it is a member of the group. If yes, then it won't go further. But if not, then it will look for other permissions. Before changing permissions, you first learn managing ownerships. So let's have a look on default permissions. CD slash home LSFNL. As you can see here, the home directory for user Jerry. And if you watch carefully, there is user Jerry, which is the owner of the home directory Jerry. And there is group Jerry, which is the group owner of directory Jerry. I hope you remember that a primary group has been created when you create a user and that user is the only member of that particular group. So let's have a look on an example. mkdir slash private and cd slash private. Now I will create two directories here. Staff and sales. As you know, I have created these directories as root. So if I do ls l, root is the owner and group root is the group owner of these directories. Let's understand what is actually happening here. So user root has first three permissions that is rwx which means read write and execute. The group root has two permissions that is read and execute and others have read and execute permissions as well. So let's say you want people who are the member of the staff group to be able to get write permissions for the staff directory and you want the member of sales group to be able to write in sales directory. To do that you have to make sure that group staff will be the owner group owner for directory staff and group sales to be the group owner of sales directory. To do this, we use chgrp for change group and sales sales and chgrp staff staff. Let's do ls-l and you can see that the group owner has now been changed. You can also change user owner of these directories which is currently is the user root. That is because user root has created the directory. It is good to make head of department the user owner of the directory. Let's say Harry is the head of sales department. So ch own for change owner and Harry sales. And assume Robin is the head of staff department. So change own Robin staff. You can see now the owners has been changed. So this is what you must know before assigning permissions. In the next lecture, I will explain you about basic and special permissions. Generally permissions are of two types, basic permissions and special permissions. Let's start with the basic permissions first. So basic permissions are read, write and execute. These permissions are used in files and directories. As you can see on your screen, I have drawn a diagram to explain you about basic permissions. So there are three permissions and one column is for files and the other column is for directories. So let's talk about read permission on files. Basically the idea of read on files is that a user is capable of opening a file, opening a file and do whatever the user wants to do with it without making modifications. 
so let's write down open now the important is read on directory because some people think that read on directory means that a user can read all the files in a directory but that's not true read on directory means that a user can list the files that are inside the directory so the user can see which files are in the directory but a user cannot read the file data because you need read and write permissions in order to open the files and read the matter then we have the write permission write on the file means that a user can modify contents of the file and write on directory means that the user can modify the contents of a directory but what exactly does it mean if you can modify the contents of a directory well basically it means the user can add or delete files in the directory at the end we have execute execute is a very specific permission on linux and it's the permission which makes linux a secure operating system because execute on a file means user can run the contents of the file if the contents of the files is executable program code and the interesting fact is no file in linux has executable permission by default and that makes linux a more secure operating system than others suppose a linux user have received a email attachment and the email attachment cannot run by default because they won't have execute permission on linux and then we have execute permission on directory which is a bit special it means a user can use cd command to get inside a directory and do whatever he want to do with this directory so this is all you need to know about the use of basic permissions on linux this is part 4 of managing permissions in this lecture i will show you how you can manage basic permissions but first you have to learn a couple of things in this lecture you will learn how to use ch mode to change permissions on files and directories let's see an example ch mode 750 on test file you can see three different numbers are used in the command to change the permission for test file to understand these digits you must know that read is equal to 4 write is equal to 2 and execute is equal to 1 and you should also know that digits refers to users groups and others so you can see here 7 which is 4 plus 2 plus 1 that means the user gets read write and execute permissions then we have 5 which is 4 plus 1 that means a group gets read and execute permissions and 0 that means others won't get any permissions now Let's have a look at permissions of staff and sales directories. You can see that a user has read write and execute permissions and group has read and execute permissions and others has read and execute as well. Suppose you want that members of the group can create files in their group directories and also you want that nobody can has access to these directories. In order to do that you can use ch mode command. so ch mode 770 on staff which enable a user to read write and execute and members of the group owner can also have read write and execute permissions and the others get no permissions at all let's do ls minus l and you can see that it is all set as per your requirements you can also use ch mode in relative mode so ch mode g plus w on sales let's do ls minus l and you can see group owner has write permissions too g plus w means we want to assign write permissions to group members we can also do ch mode o minus r x on sales which means i take away read and execute permissions from others so the conclusion is you can either use numbers like 770 or you can use alternate method like u plus r w x g plus r w x o minus rwx both are same but i personally prefer to use absolute mode which means use using digits digits are easy to use and to remember as well all you need to take care of is read is equal to 4 write is equal to 2 and execute is equal to 1 in this lecture we will talk about special permission i have created a presentation for this 
so the first special permission is set user id it means if it applied on a file a user can run the executable files as the owner of the file and not with his own user permissions on directories this permission doesn't have a meaning set group id means that if you run executable files it will run as a group owner and not with the permissions of the user owner now you will know that both set user id and set group id are very dangerous permissions if applied on files and set group id on directories means that group ownership is inherited on all items that are created in a directory before starting practical of special permissions i just want to give you an overview of the special permissions that are available so first there is set user id which has the value of 4 if you want to use ch mode in the absolute mode you can also use u plus s using ch mode of course then we have set group id with a digit value of 2 in absolute mode and you can also use g plus s if you are in relative mode i hope you know that absolute mode means using digits to assign permissions and relative mode means using characters with plus sign to add permissions and minus sign to retrieve permissions then we have sticky bit with a value of 1 and you can also use plus t i will explain sticky bit in the next lecture so let's perform practical of special permission some people have problem understanding special permissions as i just explained set user id means that a script which is executable is run with the permissions of the owner of the script so let me do an example and let's go to the home directory of user harry and let me create a shell script here let's call it know your fortune or know your future so as every shell script should start with shebang what is shebang well the first line of the script which indicates that it is a shell script is called shebang and let's type hi do you want to know your future and we have to let shell script wait and completely ignore the answer and execute a command like rm hyphen rf followed by slash well i hope you all know that it is a very dangerous command now in order to make it a executable script which by default it isn't i type ch mode plus x on know your fortune and do an ls minus l and we can see that the script is now executable you must know that it is a bad idea to run this script as a root so let's do it as user harry and do an ls and harry think wow let's know the future and run it what is important to understand is what will happen if harry is going to start this shell by entering the reply well basically it starts with a user harry so if the script is going to try to remove many files it will do it as harry and as no one else so the worst thing that can happen is that harry his home directory is wiped and everything else where he has permission to write to will be gone as well and that is bad but not very bad because only thing that harry has write permissions will be affected now let's do set user id so in order to understand set user id we need to have a look at the properties of the file you can see it is owned by user root and it is owned by group root set user id means that if the file is executed it will execute as the owner of the file so to set user id i would do ch mod u plus s on know your future let's do an ls minus l and you can see that it is marked in red which indicates that something potentially dangerous is going on here and now 
let's become Harry again and Harry sees this file and try to run it and can you imagine what happens it will destroy everything okay that is why you don't want to use set user id anytime i personally never face a situation where using set user id is the only solution to a problem so i suggest you not to use this permission ever set user id is only applied to some system files let me show you some files to find these files i am using find slash hyphen perm which will find files based on their permissions slash 4000 4000 means that the first digit in the permission settings must be a 4 which you have just seen in the set user id and the other ones doesn't matter for now and as i press enter it takes some time to find all these files you will see a couple of error messages and then we see a list of files that do have set user id permission for very good reasons there is one file slash user slash bin slash passwd that's the binary that allows users to change their password let's find out why let me do ls hyphen l on user bin passwd you can see s on the position where you normally see an x for execute which is for user and it indicates a set user id now why this passwd have set user id it is because the password has to be written to the etc shadow file and as you can see that there is no permission whatsoever on the etc shadow file which means that only a root can access the etc shadow file which is good but if a user wants to change its password it needs to be written in any way to the etc shadow file and that is why the user takes a root permission at the moment when a user is using the passwd command and there is nothing wrong with that because passwd is well written program and it is securely been analyzed and there is nothing wrong in it so basically there are some system binaries that contain set user id and keep it like that and never ever try to use set user id permission on anything else <coughs> as you have learned there are two other special permissions that are important i have already explained set group id in the previous lecture which is basically same as the set user id you are not going to use that what you are going to use is <coughs> the set group id on a directory so let's see how id harry and you can see that harry is a member of sales group so for now i doesn't need harry as it is the owner of the directory you know what Harry is also a member of a staff and it's a fact that the group staff is group owner of directory staff and the group owner has read write and execute permissions on directory staff. Harry should be able to write files to directory staff. Let's try it. First I have to become Harry. Go to directory staff and create a file using touch h file 1. Let's do ls-l and what we see here that file has been created with a user that created the file is user owner and the primary group of that user is group owner. Now what's wrong with that is that the mem other members of the group staff don't have any right permission to this file and that is not useful in the shared group environment as you know staff folder is a shared folder among its all members and that is why we have set group id so apply it by typing chmod g plus s on staff do ls minus l and you can see the lowercase s where you normally see the execute permission for the group owner now let's become harry again and go to private staff directory touch h file 2 
and ls hyphen l and as you can see the file is now automatically group owned by the group staff as you can see on your screen that sticky bit doesn't have any meaning on files but on directories it means that you can delete files only if you are the owner of the directory or if you are the owner of the parental directory and that is also a very useful permission for setting up a shared group environment because with this permission one member of the group cannot delete files that were created by another member of the group let's see the practical first let me check if we have anyone else who is in the group staff so use grep staff etc group we have jerry jerry is the member of staff group as well so let's become jerry and as jerry i go to staff directory and i create few files touch j file 1 j file 2 and j file 3 let's do ls minus l and you can see that the group ownership is set correctly now will you know that jerry is allowed to delete files created by harry of course yes because he is the member of the group staff and group staff has right permissions to the directory which means you can delete anything in that directory it is obvious that harry wouldn't be happy with that and that is why you need sticky bit i am applying on slash private because sticky bit is what you must have been applied on a shared work environment you can see a upper case t on the position where there is normally an x for others well it's an upper case because there is no x behind it it's just sticky bit it would be a lower case if there is x behind it same goes by the way for the set group id that we seen here on the directory as well so lower case s because there is x behind it and it would be an upper case s if there wouldn't be an x behind it let's become harry go to staff directory and let's try to delete files created by jerry <coughs> so rm hyphen f j file 1 which is not permitted because of sticky bit so this is why you need sticky bit on shared environment one thing more i want to tell you is that in this case if you become jerry and if you try to delete h file 2 files created by harry you will able to do that yes it is i know that i have applied sticky bit but Jerry is the user owner of staff directory which is the parental directory for the files created by Harry there is one directory in your system which has sticky bit applied by default and that is tmp directory because tmp is a directory where anyone can write files and nobody wants that a user can delete files created by another user in the tmp directory acl stands for access control list Let's see why it is so important and why you should learn it. Access control list give permissions to more than one user or group on a file or directory. Normally, the file has only one user who is owner of the file and one group that is group owner of the file. But with access control list, you can grant many permissions to one group and little bit less permissions to another group. Also, Access control list can be used to set default permissions for newly created files and directories. For a specific directory environment, ACL is quite good because using access control list you can make sure that whatever file is created in a specific directory always gets the right permissions, which is very useful in shared group environment. If you want to use access control list, you must make sure to set the ACL mount option. This mount option is not supported in all file systems by default. So in many occasions it's a manual action. And you can do that using a mount option in the slash etc fstep file or in systemd. I will explain it later. 
then you can use tune to fs for ext file systems to put the mount option not in a separate file but to make it a property of file system itself it means that if a file system ever moved to some other server the properties will automatically be moved with it in xfs you don't have to do anything because it is a default mount option there are two commands that are involved in managing access control list first is set fsel for set file access control list and second is get fsel which is used to get an overview of current access control list settings on files let's understand it with an example set fsel hyphen m g colon sales colon rx on private staff the important part here is g colon sales colon rx which tells us that the group sales is getting read and execute permissions on the staff folder if you want to assign same permissions to user then we have to use u colon harry colon rx in place of g colon sales colon rx after setting acl you also need to set the default acl that takes care of all items that you are going to create later in the same folder for this we use set fsel hyphen m d colon g colon sales colon rx on private staff directory where d colon means that it is setting default acl for the staff directory let's see how access control list works in my private directory which we have previously talked about you can see there is staff and sales group suppose sales group needs access to the staff directory and the staff group needs access to the sales directory but you don't want to grant any permissions to others because that would just give away too many permissions in this case access control list offers a perfect solution because you can grant one user or one group as the owner of the directory and what we need here is group that is granted on a directory in this case you cannot use chgrp because that would remove the primary group assignments so what we need to do is set fsel to create the access control list in order to manage access control list there are two commands that is get fsel on staff I didn't set any access control list yet but I want to show you what it looks like generally it shows the same information that ls hyphen l shows so the file name is staff and the user owner is jerry the group owner is staff then we have some flags which is the set use set group id and sticky bit then we have permissions for the user and the permissions of the group there is one thing important to look at working with access control list and that is access control list is copying over the current permission settings to the access control list settings which means that before starting to do anything on access control list you want to make sure that your permissions are all set the way you want it to be if after setting access control list you are going to change the permissions or permission settings you will end up in a mess the system was just not created that flexible that it can deal with that so make sure first to take care of all permissions and once you have done that starting using the access control list as we want the sales group to have read permission on the staff directory to do that we use set fsel hyphen capital r for recursive that will set access control list on any items that are already existing in the staff directory hyphen m for modify g colon sales colon rx on staff let's check it get fsel staff and you can see that there is a line added so the group sales have the read and execute permissions you will also see mask which is not important for us so ignore it to take care of new items which will be added in staff directory we can set default acl 
setting default ACL is very easy. Just repeat the command remove hyphen R and add D colon before G colon sales colon Rx and that's it. Now this will take care that the current permissions on ACL settings on the staff directory will automatically applied on any item that will be created in this directory. Let's do get FACL staff and you can see some extra information added here for default settings. Now let's test the default ACL by creating a folder XYZ inside the staff directory and let's do ls minus l on staff xyz and you can see the acl permission applied which is set as default acl that means it works one important thing to remember about acl is that when setting acl on directory at any time you need to use two commands the first command is set facl hyphen r hyphen m g colon sales colon rx on staff and second command is to remove hyphen r and add d colon in the syntax. Well, it is not easy to remember the syntax for ACL. Also, it is very hard to remember all the options available to use with set FACL. So we have a nice utility, men. So men space set FACL. Scroll all the way down and you will see some examples which helps you a lot in future. When your server boots up, there are many services starts automatically. To see them, use PS AUX and you can see there are many of them. Let's see how many by using PS AUX pipe WC and the result is shocking. So everything in Linux that is happening, it is happening as a process and we can manage it. Then we have jobs. A job is a concept used by the shell or you can say any program that a user interactively starts that doesn't detach that is not a daemon is a job. So let's clear it with an example. dd if is equal to dev 0 of dev null. What is happening here that it is copying nothing to nowhere and still it is working on the shell keeping the current shell busy. To get rid of this situation you can move this job to the background or you can stop it and to do that you would use control Z. As you can see on your screen my job has been stopped or if I want to move that in background I type BG. Now it's a background job in this shell. To get an overview of all jobs that are currently running you can use jobs command. So jobs are always related to the current shell environment. On the other hand processes are the total amount of tasks that are running on your system no matter how and when or by whom they are started. Every command that you start from the shell is considered as shell jobs. So if I type ll that's a shell job. Many shell jobs can run and then stops immediately because they have completed their work. But some commands can run longer and you can manage them. You can transfer them to the background and you can continue with other work. For example, if I type slip 120 then it makes my current shell busy for 2 minutes because slip 120 means going to slip for 120 seconds. And it gives me my shell back only after 2 minutes. But suppose I need my shell back and want to do more work. I can press Ctrl Z which stops the shell job. Then I type BG. Remember BG works on the last shell job. We can use jobs as I explained it earlier. It shows that slip 120 is running in the background. Now let's say you want to take a background job to the foreground then you have to use fg command like fg1 one is the number assigned to background job now again it makes your shell busy so you can use control c and it is gone permanently <coughs> to see all processes running on your system you can use psaux 
run this command as a root because if you run it as any other user you will only able to see processes of that particular user and not of the whole system you can also filter the results like ps aux pipe head and you can see the first there is the name of the user who started the process next every process has unique identification number and that is pid like number 1 is the system d process which is first started by the kernel and it will take care of all other processes then we have amount of cpu usage and the amount of memory usage of this process and then we have some information about memory usage because linux processes may use two kinds of memory first is virtual memory size represented by vsz and the second is resident memory size represented by rss rss is the memory that is allocated by ram which the system d is using now and virtual memory is reserved by system d but it actually not allocated in ram next there is tty which is a terminal that a process is running on it shows question mark for background processes next we have current status of processes in this example most of the processes are in sleep mode and is indicated by s then we have the start time then we have the total amount of time that a process has been running and at last we have the associated command among all these information pid is the most important because we use pid for process management then we have three different commands kill pkill and kill all commands to terminate a process in linux linux operating system comes with kill command to terminate a process the command makes it possible to continue running the server without the need of reboot after a major change or update here comes the great power of linux and this is one of the reasons why linux is running on 90% of servers on the earth kill command send a signal a specified signal to be more perfect to a process the kill command can be executed in a number of ways directly or from a shell script the common syntax for kill command is kill signal or option followed by pids for a kill command a signal name could be sai up sig kill or sig term and signal value is 1915 respectively like sig kill is used with 9 or minus 9 followed by pid would kill a process among all these three sig term is the default and safest way to kill a process sig hub is less secure way of killing a process and sig kill is the most unsafe way among the three because it terminates a process without saving and as you know you must know the process id in order to kill a process you can also kill process by using their name like p kill my sql d okay but what if a process has too many instances and a number of child processes well we have kill all command for such processes it is simple to use just type kill all followed by the name of the process like kill all mysql d to check the status of a process use system ctl status firewall d <coughs> or service mysql status then we have top command the top command allows users to monitor processes and system resources usage on linux It is one of the most useful tools in the toolbox of system admin and it comes pre-installed on every distribution. So <clears throat> when you run top command you will see information similar to this screenshot. The upper half of the output contains statistics on processes and resource usage while the lower half contains a list of the currently running processes. You can use the arrow keys and page up or down button to browse through the list 
and if you want to quit simply press Q so that's it for this tutorial this is the end of part 2 in this part you have learned how to use Vim you have also learned about Linux directory structure then you have learned about various basic commands and managing processes and managing basic and special permissions did you know that getting help in Linux is a very easy process because there are so many commands and it is difficult to remember all of them and each command has its own options available to be used with that command for example you know that user add command is used to create a user but you don't know that how many options this command has so there is a nice utility hyphen hyphen help you can use hyphen hyphen help with any command you want let's do user add hyphen hyphen help but information provided here is not sufficient also sometimes it's difficult to choose the right command as there are 2000 plus commands that are available in Linux so there are main pages available in Linux to help you out most commands in Linux are clearly explained in man and if you don't know which command you need you can also use man hyphen k k means keyword suppose you want to know how to set time on your Linux system but you don't know how to do it in such situation you can use man hyphen k time this command search all the commands or their description that contains the word time you can see there are many commands available with numbers these numbers refer to the section of main pages the command comes from if you want to know which command to use you first have to understand sections of main pages each section of main describes different kinds of commands and you can get a overview of their meaning by typing main main pages among these available sections section 1 5 and 8 are most important for a system administrator section 1 describes commands that are available to be used by any standard user section 5 contains documents configuration files and section 8 describes commands for system management but these commands can be run only by the user root in our case for changing server time we have two options section 1 sounds good because it contains commands to be used by ordinary user section 8 also makes sense because root is also be able to change server time so let's try both the options one by one you can filter down the results of main pages by using grep command grep is one of the most important command in linux it's a filtering utility which allows a user to search the results of a command for a specific task you can also use it to search a text in text files so man hyphen k time pipe grep1 if commands are separated by pipe it means that the output of the first command is used as the input for the second command so man hyphen k time pipe grep1 filters the output of man minus k time command to show you only the lines that contain one from this output let's have a look on date command which is used to set the system date and time to get more info about this command we use man date let's scroll down a little bit and see if there is any useful info available look at minus s which has description set time described by string but what is string to know about string use slash string press n again and again until we get some description about a string yes here is the description which explains the string you can read it so probably command like date minus s 15 colon 15 change the current time to 15 colon 15 to verify use date and yes it worked now you have learned about hyphen hyphen help and main pages with sections 
well you can also use date minus minus help but you know that it just gives you a summary of all the options that are available to be used with this command but it is only useful if you already know a little bit about date command hyphen hyphen help is a nice utility but it helps you only if you are already a little bit familiar with n command now let's talk about globing and wildcards wildcard is an easy way to refer to certain part part of file names but the official term is globing globing is also known as using wildcards and they are used to match file names well if you want to know more about it you are free to have a look on main pages of globing just type main 7 glob and you will get an overview of all options that are available let's do the practical first i go to etc directory as you know that etc contains so much files which is great for our practical as there are so many files in linux you might not always remember the last part of a file name if that happens we use ls host star for example or if you are not sure about first part either you can use ls star host star which looks for all the files that contains host somewhere in their name the result you get is not always contains files but it also shows you the directories and their contents as well to get rid of this you can use minus d option type ls minus d star host star and it will only show you files and directories and not their contents let's see another example ls minus d question mark question mark st star this will show files and directories that have st on third and fourth position in their names there is so much you can do it by yourself like ls question mark ost the question mark represents a single character and the one character that can be anything so it doesn't matter what is on the first position of a file name as long as second third and fourth positions are o s n t we can also provide choices between different characters by using square brackets like ls bracket h m bracket close o s t star which looks for file names host and most but if you add excl exclamation mark before h m then it will look for all the files that has host but not most and host an exclamation mark here stands for not now let's talk about input output redirection but first you have to understand three terms first is standard input second is standard output and third is standard error so the std in that is your standard input is basically what the command is expecting the input to come from normally it's your keyboard std out is basically where the command is sending its output to normally it's your monitor then there is std error which is the location where the command is sending errors to normally that's also the monitor of your computer but it can be different commands so the thing is with output redirection is that you can manipulate the three of them let's see the practical first we use pipe pipes are useful for commands that produce a lot of outputs like ps aux you can see a lot of output generated too much to read here so if you want to read it page by page you need to pipe the output to less ps aux pipe less is the command for it use space bar to proceed to the next page press q to quit now let's move to file descriptors as you know that there are three file descriptors first is std in suppose as an ordinary user i type find slash minus name 
star dot rpm you see a lots of error because a standard user cannot access to these directories now if i don't want to see these errors i can redirect them a different location so find slash minus name star dot rpm to greater than slash dev null digit 2 and greater than is a symbol of standard error now ls greater than output dot txt well this command sends the output of ls to output dot txt file instead of showing you the output on your screen and greater than is a symbol of standard output you can later read the file by using cat command so cat output dot text and that's it now let's see an example of standard input it is denoted by the symbol of less than the mail program in linux can help you to send emails from the terminal you can type the contents of the email using the standard device keyboard but if you want to attach a file to an email you can use the input redirection operator so mail hyphen s hyphen s stands for subject news update xyz at the rate gmail.com less than news flash this would attach the file with the email and it would be sent to the recipient now you have learned about standard input output and error but there is one more thing you should know if you remember we have redirected the output to a output.txt file but if you do it again it will override the existing file so to prevent it we use ls greater than greater than output dot text well double greater than append a file that is it prevents a file from overwritten there are two commands you can use to install or manage a software in linux rpm and yum commands what are they let's find out our first command is rpm it is used in old days and now it is replaced by yum but getting extra knowledge won't hurt you so to install any package we use rpm minus ivh followed by package name dot rpm what is happening here is rpm command followed by ivh i is for installation v for verbose and h for hashes hashes used to show the progress this command is going to analyze and see if there is any dependencies dependency means in order to install specified package you first need to install a lot of packages in earlier days if there are any dependencies the rpm command would stop and complain that this package needed dependencies so you have to install all dependencies one by one and it's a time consuming process but the good news is nowadays you don't have to do that now we have meta packet handlers so there are repositories and repositories are installation sources on the internet of course you can create repositories on your system locally as well as now i am using red hat enterprise linux i got yum yum is the meta packet handler and yum stands for yellow dog updater modified if i want to install a package i use yum install package name dot rpm now what happen yum will look for dependencies and if it found it knows how to install that automatically it means you don't need to install each dependency by yourself yum would do it for you sounds good but yum will only work if you have repositories let's have a look on how to set repositories locally use yum repo list and you will find there is nothing here normally repositories are something that are on the internet or on the centralized server but for this practical i have created my own repository you can also create it on your own i have attached a text file 
with this lecture that contains step by step procedure for setting up a repository. So cd slash repo. I want to use this repo directory as my repository. And in order to do that, I need to go in etc yum.repos.d directory. And I create a file with the name rel7 underscore 3.repo. Be careful. It is very important thing that the extension of a file is .repo. Without it, yum is unable to find it. In this file, you need to type three things only. So, first, your need, you need a label for the repository that would be rel7 underscore 3. You can type in anything you like. Then you have to specify a name like rel7 underscore 3. Then we have base URL. This is the most important part because here you are telling your system where it can find the repository. After base URL, there is the URI. That's a resource identifier and the resource identifier can be file colon slash slash. If it's a local directory or HTTP colon slash slash or FTP colon slash slash or anything else you may be using for accessing your repository. After file colon slash slash mention the path where your system gonna be find the repository. As this is a local path, I need to specify a slash indicating a root directory followed by the name of my repository, which is repo. Next we type gpg check is equal to zero, which is for gpg file integrity checking. For real environment, it is good to set gpg check to 1. 1 is to enable and 0 is to disable a gpg check. Now let's do yum repo list. And you can see we have got the repository. Let's do something else like yum search ftp or http or anything else you want. It will look up in the repository. As we have set up the repository, we can now use yum command. Yum is really set up to be an easy to use command. Suppose I want to install a package, then I use yum install httpd, that is your package name. So it checks for any dependencies and then it shows you total download size and installed size and then ask you for is this okay? Well. Yes, that's okay for me. Then it goes to repositories, downloads and installs the packet. It takes some time depending upon what packets you ask to install and then shows you that it is completed by showing a word complete at the end of the installation. And that is how it works. Then we can also use yum list all to list all packages that are available which is a nice way of showing packages that have a specific version. You can also use yum list installed to get a list of all the packages that are installed on your system. Now you know how to install packages but what if you want to remove a package well then you have to use yum remove package name. You can also use yum remove hyphen y httpd. Yes, you can use hyphen y for installation as well. So that it would not ask you is this okay in between the process. Now let's talk about rpm command. All softwares that is installed on your system is tracked in an rpm database. And on this database you can perform queries to find out status information and much more about packages. Let's do an example. And in this example, I want to know more about some program. So let's do chronie. chronie is a time service. As a time service, there is a configuration file associated to it. And there is documentation associated as well. So I type which chronie d. Cronyd is a daemon process that is used for managing crony service. And in the output, we see the name of the process. 
let's perform some queries using rpm or red hat packet manager first is rpm minus qa use this query if you want to query all installed packages you have a huge output here our next query is rpm hyphen q vsftpd where vsftpd is the name of a packet well it is not installed so let's do something else like rpm minus q firefox if you don't like typing you can use tab for auto completion now it is showing the output like firefox 45.3.0 minus 1 el 7 underscore 2 x 86 underscore 64 well in this output firefox is the name of the package next to firefox we have the version of firefox and then 86 underscore 64 is the architecture and at last we have dot rpm which is an extension that is not shown here as we have used rpm minus qa we got a lot of output we can use rpm minus qa pipe less to see results page by page then we have rpm minus ql firefox ql is used to view all the files of an installed rpm package ql stands for query list and qa stands for query all next we use rpm with minus qa hyphen hyphen last it shows you list of all the recently installed rpm packages now if you want to upgrade an rpm package you can use rpm minus u v h with capital u followed by package name to check an rpm signature package you can use rpm hyphen hyphen check sig package name with version dot rpm it's not mandatory to use all these queries for now as a linux beginner you know how to install and remove a software now to erase or delete or remove a package we use rpm minus e firefox let's see another command which so which mkdir would show you the location of mkdir command so it is in the user bin mkdir now if you want to know that which package belongs to these files we use query file option so rpm minus qf on user bin mkdir and core utils is the name of that package one last query is query info that is rpm minus qi core utils to get information about the package let's learn something different like you can use eject command to eject cd and to close cd drive use eject space minus t since we know more about files and their representation in the file system understanding links or shortcuts is a piece of cake a link is nothing more than a way of matching two or more file names to the same set of file data there are two ways to achieve this hard link and soft link hard link is associated with two or more file names with the same inode hard links share the data blocks on the hard disk while they continue to behave as independent files i have used a word inode what is inode well an inode is an entry in inode table containing information about a regular file and directory an inode is a data structure on a traditional ext3 or ext4 file system inode number also called as index number then we have soft link or symbolic link symbolic link is a small file that is a pointer to another file a symbolic link contains the path of the target file instead of a physical location on the hard disk 
Since inodes are not used in this system, softlinks can pan across partitions. Remember that removing the target file for a symbolic link makes the link useless. Each regular file is in a principle of hard link. Hard links cannot span across partitions since they refer to inodes and inode numbers are only unique within a given partition. It may be argued that there is a third kind of link, the user space link, which is similar to a shortcut in MS Windows. These are files containing metadata which can only be interpreted by the graphical file manager. To the kernel and the shell, these are just normal files. They may end in a .desktop or .lnk suffix. I hope now the concept of hard link and soft link is clear to you. Now let's do the practical. So in order to do my demo, I am going to show you ls-il on etc host. A file etc host is going to be the starting point of this demo. Now ls-l will give you a long listing. <coughs> Sorry. And minus i gives you the inode. The inode contains the unique administration of a file. First, let's create a hard link. In a hard link, you just type ln followed by the source file, which is the original file you want to link to. And then the destination file. In this case, it's my servers. Now, if I do ls minus il slash etc host my servers, to see the properties of both. Then you can see it's marked in blue, which is indicating that it is a link. You can see that the link counter that is set to 2. You can see the inode that is exactly the same for both files. As I explained earlier, a hard link is just like a secondary name that you add to the same file. So there is no difference between the original file and the link you have created. Now let's do the practical of symbolic link as well. In order to do that, I type ln minus l source file and destination file. Let's have a look on ls minus il again and see how all these three files are different. Now what you can see is that my servers and etc host haven't changed at all. But you can see that new list points to the my server files. It has gotten a new inode and permissions are wide open. And why are permissions wide open? Well, that is because permissions are managed on the destination file and not on this file. Now let's try something else and remove the my servers file. If we do ls minus il again on the two remaining files, then you can see that there is a problem with new list. It is turned black with red letters. And if you try to see the contents of new list file, which is an entry in the current directory still exists. Well, we still get no such file or directory that is because the my servers file doesn't exist anymore. Now let's try something else. In order to do that, I want to be a standard user and this user is going to link etc shadow to my shadow. And what happens here? Well, it is a nice new feature in rel 7 that a standard user is failed to create a hard link. Not because etc shadow doesn't exist, but because the standard user doesn't have any permissions on the etc shadow file. In order to create a hard link, you must have at least read permission on that particular file. And that's it. If you want to make backups, you will use TAR. TAR stands for Tape Archive, which is the most commonly used tape drive backup command used by the Linux or Unix system. It allows you to quickly access a collection of files and place them into a highly compressed archive file, commonly called TARBall or TAR.gzip and bzip in Linux. 
the algorithm used for compressing of dot tar dot gz and dot tar dot bz2 are gzip or bzip algorithms respectively in this video we will be going to review and discuss various tar command examples including how to create archive files using different compression how to extract archive file extract a single file view content of file verify a file add files or directories to archive file estimate the size of tar archive file etc the main purpose of this video is to provide various tar command examples that might be helpful for you to understand and become expert in tar archive manipulation so tar minus cvf backup dot tar slash etc this command will create a tar archive file backup dot tar for a directory slash etc in current working directory see the command in action let's discuss each option that we have used in this command option c creates a new dot tar archive file option v verbosely show the dot tar file progress and option f is used for file name type of the archive file now let's see how to create a tar dot gz archive file to create a compressed gzip archive file we use the option z for example tar cvzf new backup dot tar dot gz slash etc command will create a compressed new backup dot tar dot gz file for the slash etc directory please note that tar dot gz or tzz both are same now let's create a tar dot bz2 archive file the bz2 feature compress and create archive file less than the size of the gz the bz2 compression takes more time to compress and decompress files as compared to gz which takes less time so tar cvf j backup 1.tar.bz2 slash etc to create highly compressed tar file we use option as j this command will create a backup 1.tar.bz2 file for a directory slash etc now let's see another example to untar a tar archive file to untar or extract a tar file just issue the command using option x for extract so tar minus xvf backup dot tar this command will untar the file backup dot tar in present working directory if you want to untar in a different directory you can add option minus c and then specify the desired path at the end of the command then to uncompress tar dot gz archive file we use tar minus xvf new backup dot tar dot gz and to uncompress tar dot bz2 archive file we use tar minus xvf backup 1 dot tar dot bz2 now let's try something else let's say you want to list the contents of tar archive file then use the command with option t so tar minus tvf backup dot tar would help you with this now let's try something different let's say you want to extract a group of files then you should use while cards for example to extract a group of files whose extension is dot sh then you type tar minus xvf backup dot tar minus minus while cards then star dot sh if your system found any file or script with dot sh as extension it will extract it in the present working directory now 
let's say you want to add files or directories to tar archive file to do that you would use the option r to append for example i add a file abc.txt and a directory php to existing backup.tar archive file first i create file using touch abc.txt and then i create a folder mkdir php now tar minus rvf backup dot tar space abc dot text and tar minus rvf backup dot tar space php now the process to add files and directories to tar dot gz and tar dot bz2 files would be same as this you can try remaining options by using tar minus minus help or if you want to know more about tar you can try man page of tar by just typing man space tar i hope by now tar and its various options are clear to you in this video i have used slash etc directory for backup you can choose any directory or file of your choice and that's it for this tutorial Linux logs provide a timeline of events for the Linux operating system and applications and are a valuable troubleshooting tool when you encounter issues. Essentially, analyzing log files is the first thing an administrator needs to do when an issue is discovered. For desktop app specific issues, log files are written to different locations. For example, Chrome writes crash reports to tilde slash dot chrome slash crash reports. Where a desktop application writes logs depends on the developer and if the app allows for custom log configuration. Files are stored in plain text and can be found in the slash where slash log directory and subdirectory. There are Linux logs for everything for system, kernel, package manager, boot process, apache, mysql, etc. You will need to be the root user to view or access log files on Linux. Log files are controlled by daemons like rsyslogd and journalD. Let's see how they are working together to handle log information. So we have services and these services are providing logging information. Now it's up to the service to decide how exactly they want to do that. It is possible to do it direct write and that means the service all by opens a log file and write directly to it. The file could be anything like slash anywhere slash event one dot log. Other way is a service can use systemctl. Systemctl is used to start service. And it keeps track of what is happening while the service is starting anyway. And everything that goes to systemctl will be written to journalD, which is the systemD related way of handling log information. And there is another way of handling logging as well. And that is through rsyslogd. And it will write information to where log anything. Now what? If you want to access the logging information, well, then you have two choices journalctl and rsyslog. Journalctl is used to grab log information from journalD, and rsyslog is the classical logging method. You may ask either we should use journalctl or rsyslog to maintain our login information. We can integrate both rsyslog and journalD. The rsyslog messages will be sent to journalD or vice versa. The facility is not enabled by default. Now let's talk about journal first. Journal is a component of systemd. It capture log messages of kernel logs, syslog messages or error log messages. It collects them, index them and makes available to the user. Journal are stored in slash run slash log slash journal directory. 
Now you know that journal CTL is the new way to see logging information. So let's do the practical. Let's say you want to view current log database. You should use journal CTL and the output is almost like tail minus f slash where log messages. But there are some remarkable difference. In general CTL, lines having notices or warning will be bold. Timestamps are your local time zone. After every boot, a new line will be added to clarify that new log begins from now. Errors will be highlighted red. Now if you want to see log messages of current boot only, then you use option minus B. So journal CTL minus B would be the command you have to use. Let's see some error messages. Type journal CTL minus P error and hit enter. Now to have last 10 events that happen, type journal CTL minus F. Then to see how much space is occupied by journal, use journal CTL minus minus this minus usage. Next, to get data of previous day, use journal CTL hyphen hyphen since yesterday. To get current system time zone, use time date CTL command. To get a list of available time zone, use time date CTL list minus time zones. Now let's see integration of journal D with RCS log. With the integration, the RCS log messages will be sent to journal D or vice versa. The facility is not enabled by default. To enable sending log messages to journal, rcslog.conf is required to configure. So, vim space slash etc slash rcslog.conf and search for modload imux soc and modload im journal and add omit local login off in a new line. So that's all we have to do with this file. Now save the file and exit. Now open another file vim slash etc slash rcslog dot d slash listen dot com and look for a line system log socket name slash run slash systemd slash journal slash syslog and if the line is not present in the file then add this line by yourself. Our next topic is log rotate. Log rotate is a handy tool for system administrators who wish to take the slash where slash log directory under their control. The log rotate command is called daily by the cron scheduler and it reads files like slash etc slash log rotate dot com or files in the directory slash etc slash log rotate dot d. Most of the services like Apache web server, MySQL and KDE desktop manager etc installed on your system create a configuration file for log rotate in slash etc slash log rotate dot d. To configure log rotate there are couple of files. As you know in slash etc you will find log rotate dot con file and it contains information about how log rotate works. Anything in log rotate dot d directory will always override the settings in the log rotate dot conf. So first open log rotate dot conf by using vim etc log rotate dot conf. First setting is weekly that means if nothing else is specified files will be rotated weekly. Then we have rotate 4 which means that old 4 copies of file will be kept before files thrown away. Then there is create that means new files are created and date ext means that the date will be used as extension. Then we have compress. Enabling compress means the files will be compressed once it has been rotated. It will save your space on hard disk. Next we have inclusion of log rotate dot d directory. Then we have wtmp file which is rotated monthly and there is one copy of file that is kept only. Now close the file and let's have a look at slash etc slash log rotate dot d directory. There are some files you can see by using ls and let's open a file like vim 
httpd so slash where slash log slash httpd slash star log just uses these settings you cannot see any weekly or monthly here which means that it follows defaults but still it has some additional information that tells log rotated how to deal with this file log rotated is itself not running as a service it is running as a cron job in the cd etc cron dot daily you will find log rotate script to execute log rotate daily i suggest you not to use daily file rotation for now well it happens that you need a log information but you won't get it because of log rotation of course you can configure a centralized logging server to avoid such situation but as a beginner you don't have to worry about it remember it consumes space from your hard disk so it's better to reserve separate space for it if you are working on real servers i hope now it is clear to you because for beginners the information i have provided here is sufficient for this practical i have added a new hard disk to my virtual machine now what is disk partitioning or disk slicing disk partitioning or disk slicing is the creation of one or more regions on a hard disk or other secondary storage so that an operating system can manage information in each region separately partitioning is typically the first step of preparing a newly manufactured disk before any files or directories have been created the disk stores the information about the partitions locations and sizes in an area known as the partitioning partition table that the operating system reads before any other part of the disk each partition then appears in the operating system as a distinct logical disk that uses part of the actual disk system administrators use a program called a partition editor to create resize delete and manipulate the partitions when a hard drive is installed in a computer it must be partitioned before you can format and use it partitioning a drive is when you divide the total storage of a drive into different pieces these pieces are called partitions once a partition is created it can then be formatted so that it can be used on a computer now let's do the practical so the first thing to do is to verify the available storage devices these are in slash proc slash partitions file by using cat slash proc slash partitions i can see partitions and disk that are currently existing as you can see there is a disk with the name sdb that's my new disk device and that's a device i am going to use to create partitions you can also see that there are no partitions currently existing on it now on sda device you can see that there is an sda1 and there is an sda2 as well which means there is no space left on sda device so we can create new partitions on sdb device let's type f disk f disk is very important utility used to create partitions so f disk dev sdb is telling me that device does does not contain a recognized partition table yes that is because the partition is brand new this is not an error this is just normal then it tells you to either enter a command or type m for help i type m and m gives you a menu a menu with all the different options that exist the important options are n to add new partition p to print the partition table this shows you the current layout and w to write table to disk and exit so let's start by typing p this provides me some information about current disk layout as you can see the name of the device is dev sdb and size is approximately 8 gigabyte which is equal to this amount of sectors and each sector is of 512 bytes so the sector is the default allocation unit that you will be using for creating partitions on disk let's type n to start creating a partition as you already know always use primary partition unless you want to create more than four partitions on a disk 
we can see here that there are no primary partition and no extended partition so far so it makes sense to create primary partition so i just hit the enter key to select the default which is primary partition next i hit the enter key to select the default partition number which is partition number 1 i hit the enter key again to select the first sector where the partition could be starting which is sector 2048 there is at least 1 megabyte available on disk which is used to store metadata next it ask me to enter the last sector i want to use for this partition if i simply hit enter then it will use the entire hard disk i want to use 1 gb only to create a partition so what i need to do for that is plus and the size followed by upper case k m or g please remember to use an upper case here so i type plus 1 capital g now to verify that the partition has been created type p and we can see that the partition slash /dev/sdb1 slash is available now to save and exit use w now it is good to verify that whatever written to the disk would be done correctly because in some cases it might not work all right so use cat slash proc slash partitions which shows me that i got a new sdb1 device that's great but in rare case you would find the error that the device is busy to solve it just reboot your system for now i don't require a reboot so let's continue after creating partition you have to make or assign a file system on it there are many file system that are available in rel 7 and upper versions at this point our sdb1 partition is empty which means you cannot do anything with it to do something with it you need to create a file system on it to do that we have mkfs utility if you type mkfs and hit tab key twice you will see all the different versions of mkfs that exist nowadays for beginners i recommend to use ext4 or xfs because these are the latest file system on red hat enterprise linux mkfs.xfs is the default utility to use so let's make an xfs file system mkfs.xfs minus capital l for label that is a name you want to assign to file system you can see description by using mkfs.xfs hyphen hyphen help then i type name myfs followed by the name of device that i want to format which is dev sdb1 if you can see it gives me an overview of whatever happens as i run the command let's skip it for now let's say you want to use an usb drive in both windows and linux one by one then you can format it by using mkfs.vfat file system because it is supported by both windows and linux now let's start using the sdb1 so to use it there is a mount command mount slash /dev/sdb1 slash followed by the name of the directory slash /mnt well slash /mnt is a directory which allows you to mount a partition temporary for testing purpose but if you want to make it permanent it's better to create a dedicated directory mounting means connecting some specific device to a directory so everything that is accessible in linux is through a directory to verify whether your device is mounted in slash /mnt use df -h see the last line and you will find that your device dev sdb1 of size 1 gb is mounted on slash /mnt now after using your test mount you want to disconnect device you would do it manually type u mount that is unmount slash /dev/sdb1 slash or you can do u mount on slash /mnt as well let's verify again df -h that's good whatever we have done till now is called manual mounting which means it automatically unmount your device after each reboot 
so it's annoying to mount it again and again in order to use sdb1 there is a better solution called auto mounting we can do auto mounting using an fs tab file so vim slash etc slash fs tab that is your file system table in this file you can see six columns that makes sure that the file system mounted properly first there is the device that needs to be named you have two options either you can use device name like sda1 or sdb1 or you can use uuid the idea behind uuid is that every file system has a unique id you can use blkid command to see the uuid of the file systems that you are using the fact is that the names like sda1 can be changed uuids will never change and that is why it is a good idea to use uuid here the second column slash boot here is the directory where you want to mount the file system in the third column you will find the file system that you want to use which is xfs in the fourth column you get the mount options like acl etc keep it defaults for now next in the fifth and sixth column there is a couple of numbers so column number 5 which contains one here that is backup support generally it is support for the dump backup utility and no one uses dump anymore in the sixth column we have fsck option fsck means file system check it means when your server boots the file system will be checked to see if everything is okay there are three options available here you can use 0 to skip fs check on the file system you can use 1 if this is the root file system and you want to check it first or you can use 2 if you want to do fs check and it's not a root file system now let's add our new partition sdb1 here first thing to do here is to specify the name of the device slash dev slash sdb1 next i am adding a mount option suppose i want to mount it on slash new partition directory so i type the name slash new partition next xfs then defaults next we use 1 and then i type 2 it will take care of checking the file system while booting now save the file and exit but let's say you don't want to save files on this partition you have just created it to do practice well in such case you can use 00 on fifth and sixth column of slash etc fs tab file to verify that it all works use mount hyphen a command it gives you an error that slash new partition does not exist it's a great feature in linux that when you receive an error you will get info about what you have forget to do so let's create the directory mkdir slash new partition and do mount hyphen a and to verify use df hyphen h and yes it worked so this is how you can create and mount a normal partition in linux now whatever you save in slash new partition will be saved in slash dev slash sdb1 lvm or logical volume manager is a device mapper target that provides logical volume management for the linux kernel most modern linux distributions are lvm aware to the point of being able to have their root file systems on logical volume now why use lvm lvm is a flexible approach to working with storage which means volumes can consist of more than one disk and it's easy to resize also you can replace failing disks with new one easily and it is easy to add new volumes in normal partitions you can add up to 15 partitions but in lvm logical volumes you can add up to 256 partitions let's have a look on lvm setup when working with lvm you can always start the with the physical storage device like your hard disk in our case it is sdb hard disk you can take a partition from sdb and mark it as a physical volume the physical volume next goes to volume group 
and the volume group is really like the abstraction of all storage that is available which means when you create logical volumes the logical volumes are created from the volume group and it is a logical volume you are going to create a file system on from the volume group if needed you can add additional volume as well if there is a space available and if there is no space available you can just add physical volumes to the volume group to create a logical volume you have to start by creating a partition fdisk/do/sdb as you can see we have one partition currently existing and yet we have lots of space available so i type n to create a new partition i can go with primary partition partition number 2 and then i do first sector and then plus 200 m now to create partitions that you want to use in an lvm setup there is something else you need to do you need to change the partition type so i type t on partition number 2 and i type l for an overview and let's have a look at 8e linux lvm so we need partition type 8e just verify by typing p and then i type w to save changes then i use path probe to push the changes to the kernel now i am ready to create my physical volume my volume group and my logical volume first i create physical volume pv create slash dev slash sdb2 and it tells me that dev sdb2 has been successfully created to verify use pvs which is short for physical volumes or you can use pv display as well it shows me that i have pv with a name sdb2 it is not in a vg yet and the format is lvm2 and then size of 200 megabyte now let's create volume group so vg create my vg slash dev slash sdb2 to verify use vgs or you can use vg display that's okay next step is to create a logical volume in my volume group lv create minus n my lv minus l 150 m my vg where minus n used to specify logical volume name minus l to specify size and at the end there is volume group name which is my vg in this case to verify use lvs or lv display now let's assign the file system mkfs.ext4 on dev my vg my lv where slash dev slash my vg slash my lv means slash dev slash volume group slash logical volume you can see that the file system has now been created it's time to mount it mkdir slash mnt slash my lv mount slash dev slash my vg slash my lv space slash mnt slash my lv df hyphen h shows you that the lvm volume has been mounted well you can mount it permanently by doing an entry in the fstep file fstep stands for file system table now let's talk about lvm resize operations in order to extend a file system you have to extend the logical volume and in order to increase the size of logical volume you must have space available in the volume group and if it is not you can increase or you can create a new partition and then add it to the volume group you can extend or shrink a file system so let's start by growing an lvm logical volume typically it starts with df hyphen h df is for disk free and hyphen h is for human readable format you can see here the size of my lv suppose it gets full of data and you still want to store some data in it then you can make it bigger to do that first we have to make volume group bigger and for this we have to add a physical volume so we will be doing fdisk again fdisk dev sdb 
when I use P, I found that I have two partitions already created. Now, if I create one or two more par primary partition here, then I am not able to create more partitions in future. To prevent such situation from happening, I am going to use extended partition in place of primary. Because you know that you can create maximum of four partitions in primary. So, then then E for extended partition, then enter, enter and enter to assign all remaining storage to this extended partition. Within the extended partition, I am now going to add a logical partition and I am doing that by using N again. Then L stands for logical, enter for first sector and then plus 200M for the last sector and press P to verify and all ok. Now to change partition type I press T and then specify the partition number then 8E which is default for Linux LVM and all ok and then W then part probe all looks good rest of the process is same first let's do PV create and then VG extend my VG and then dev and sdb5 then lv extend minus l plus 100m on dev my vg my lv now to resize file system you could do resize to fs on dev my vg my lv and verify it by using df hyphen h also Sometimes it takes a little bit time in that case you can go for reboot. Growing a file system is a common task but shrinking a file system is not common. First you have to make sure that in order to shrink you need a suitable file system and we have ext4 that's good. So df-h it shows you that your logical volume has been mounted on slash mnt slash my lv. To verify what file system is used in dev my vg my lv we use mount pipe grep my lv and it's ext4. Now let's unmount the file system first without it you cannot shrink a file system. So let's start by doing u mount on mnt my lv next you need to consider the order in which you want to reduce the size of the file system first step is usually to reduce the size of your file system itself and then reduce the size of logical volume and after reducing the size of the logical volume the storage can be given back to the volume group so that we can use it in future now if i type resize to fs on dev my vg my lv 100m i get error so first i have to use e2 fsck minus f on dev my vg my lv and then resize to fs on dev my vg my lv 100m now the size has been reduced to 100 megabyte next step is to reduce the size of the volume so lv reduce minus l 100 m dev my vg my lv now it asked me that are you sure because this may destroy your data and if you are ready press y else press n to cancel this process i will go with yes as you can see that logical volume my lv has been successfully resized now it's time to mount it so mount hyphen a now if we do df hyphen h we see that the volume size has been reduced one more thing i want to tell you is you can also do the same process to shrink in another way as well so let's give it a try u mount mnt my lv then lv reduce minus l 50 m hyphen r dev my vg my lv so you can see the benefit of using this method you don't need to do e2 fsck and the lv reduce command would do everything for you well 
why i use minus r go ahead and use lv reduce minus minus help to find out this single command is doing many works like e to fsck and resize to fs and lv reduce and hence it is quite useful to schedule a task in linux we have two important utilities cron and at let's see what it is cron is for task that need to be repeated on a regular basis and at is for jobs that need to be executed at a certain time let's start with the cron first first open the configuration file vim etc cron tab it contains excellent example of the meaning of the different time specifications as you can see here the first asterisk is for minute the second is for hour and then we have day of month and then we have month and then we have day of week i hope by now you had understood the structure used for cron if you want to create a cron job you can use cron tab minus e minus e is for edit but remember it will open editing mode for the current user so you must log in from the user from which you want to set a cron job there are some other configuration files as well and they are in the etc directory you can see that there is cron.d and cron daily and cron hourly and monthly and weekly as their name suggest these directories are used by rpms to drop shell scripts that will be executed on a daily hourly weekly or monthly basis so cd cron daily ls you can see a man db here which is the command that is used to create the index of man pages that you can search using man minus k if you have a look at contents then you can see that it is not a typical cron job it is a shell script and that is because you don't need to tell cron when it has to be executed cron knows that it has to be executed once every day every hour every month or every week so let's not discuss it any further knowledge i have provided it is sufficient i know some people might find it a little bit confusing but don't worry and focus on the practical of cron i am going to schedule a task as a root so cron tab minus e it opens a cron editor you cannot just create a cron file for user first watch the time in your system and then schedule the task suppose it's 1:30 in the afternoon then you can use 1 colon 32 as your defined time So I am using two minutes more than my current time. In the first column, I put minutes. In the second column, I mentioned hour, and then star, 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 followed by slash user slash bin slash mkdir space tilde slash new folder. In this command, I have provided instructions to my computer. that at a mentioned time you have to create a folder in the home directory of root user and with a name new folder i have used slash user bin mkdir well it is the path of the mkdir command and how i got that well by using where is mkdir now let's say you want to reboot the system at 2:30 daily in the afternoon first use where is reboot and then type cron tab minus e and mention 30 14 star 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 slash user slash has been slash reboot save and exit the file to get a list of cron jobs for current user use cron tab minus l as you know by default it will edit cron tab entries of current logged in user to edit other users cron tab you can use cron tab minus u for user username minus e let's try something else like you want to schedule a cron to execute on every 10 minutes then you type star slash 10 star 
star star star slash scripts slash monitor dot sh these types of cron jobs are useful for monitoring now let's see an example of at command the at command schedules a command to be run once at a particular time that you normally have permission to run the at command can be anything from a simple reminder to a complex script type at 135 pm tue echo hello good afternoon it's 135 pm and press control d to save then we have atq command it will display all pending jobs that still needs to be executed each and every line in the atq output will contain job number date r q and username each operating system uses a kernel without a kernel you cannot have an operating system that actually works windows mac and linux all have kernels and they are all different it's the kernel that also does the grunt work of the operating system besides the kernel there are a lot of applications that are bundled with the kernel to make the entire package something useful the kernel jobs is to talk to the hardware and software and to manage the system's resources as best as possible if you use ls mode you can get an overview of all the modules that are currently loaded it mentions the name of the module the size of the module and the number of dependencies the module has in the past it was necessary to load modules to get certain functionality in these days it is not necessary the kernel works together with the udev process and this process takes care of loading modules that are needed automatically you can monitor this process using udev adm monitor so it will trap all udev events and the kernel events and at the moment a new hardware is detected kernel will generate the event and it will trigger udev to do it work now i will try to connect a usb to this virtual machine and can see whether udev is acting upon that so here you can see that the kernel has detected the usb and that is how the kernel automatically takes care of loading all the modules that are needed as i mentioned with the ls mode you can see which modules are loaded at the moment but you can also manually load modules we are not going to do that in this course as a beginner the information provided here is sufficient but i promise to explain it in detail in my upcoming course which covers all advanced topics of linux in a single course for this practical we have an apache web server apache configuration is not that hard to understand first step is to install the package which is httpd so yum install minus -y httpd star now it will start installing all the packages for http it will take a little bit time to install all of the packages as there are many more it is the very first step to install packages and after installing it the important part of the configuration is etc httpd so cd slash etc slash httpd and what you can see here is that we have the conf and we have a conf.d and we have some symbolic links and a conf.modules.d now the most important configuration is in conf so cd conf and ls it's httpd.conf vim httpd.conf this is the basic core apache configuration file that contains all the parameters that you need to be changing if you want to do anything to your apache environment like listen which tells you that currently apache is listening on which port and it includes conf.modules.d directory and that is important because apache has a modular configuration 
Now let's create a basic website. You must know that by default the document root for the Apache web server is set to slash where slash www slash html. Type vim index.html. I type some text here. You don't have to learn html for this. It's a very basic example to make you understand how Apache works. Systemctl start httpd and systemctl enable httpd. Now open Firefox. Simply type Firefox and press enter. And you can see your website here. And that's it. A firewall is a network security program that controls the incoming and outgoing connections based on the rules that are set. Linux has a default firewall that is IP tables. Using IP tables an administrator can set the rules of the firewall. One can also use UFW that is uncomplicated firewall. It is like a graphical user interface which is on top of IP tables. Well, it's not exactly a GUI but it's less complicated than IP tables. Here we will use firewall D. So to make sure that service is running you type systemctl status firewall D which shows me that on this system it is running. In case it wouldn't be running you can start it by typing systemctl start firewall D and let's make sure to enable it by typing systemctl enable firewall D. So to add rules to the firewall there are a couple of commands. There is firewall cmd which is a command line utility and there is firewall config which gives you a graphical user interface in which you can click to add services. So the basic concept in firewall D are zones and services. So let's do firewall cmd hyphen hyphen get hyphen zones or firewall cmd hyphen hyphen get hyphen services if you want to have an overview of the services that are available. Let's get back to the zones. We want to check which actually is the default zone. So that would be firewall hyphen cmd hyphen hyphen get hyphen default hyphen zone. Now let's understand what are services. Basically a service is a name that is associated to a protocol and a port. I am already in the etc firewall d services directory which is a directory where an administrator can create his own services. Now the default system services are in user lib firewall d services. I type ls here and I see an overview of everything I need service wise. Now let's have a look on something which is highly complicated and that is vim high availability dot xml. It's a collection of ports. Some services needs multiple ports. You can see there is short name, there is description and there is a collection of ports. You can also use firewall config which is very convenient to work with. You can select the zone from here and in zones you have a list of services. Just click the service you want to be using to open it. If you can see here the configuration which is by default set to runtime. So the runtime configuration will be applied immediately but it will be lost once you restarted the firewall D service. If you want to make it permanent click permanent and make sure to select the services that you want to be using on your firewall. Sometimes you get error while trying to start firewall D. Well in that case use systemctl status firewall d minus l. This will show you the actual problem with little description about it. Suppose you have just booted your rel server, you first get the login screen. But what if you forget the password or someone else would have been changed the password without your permission? Well, then we have an option of resetting the root password. For this just restart your system and as you get the first screen where you generally find two options. First one is selected by default and the other is rescue mode. Press up arrow key to stop system loading and then press E to edit. 
Now we have entered in the boot menu and look for the kernel line. You can see it on your screen. You need to pass the parameter rd.break. rd stands for RAM disk and dot break will tell the system to stop at a particular location in the init RAM FS. Basically, it will bring you into a system where all the supporting modules are available. But no file systems have been mounted yet. So, it allows you to get in even before the point where you get in if you are entering in an emergency target level. Now press Ctrl X to boot your system. As you can see, the RD break brings you into a root shell without asking for any part. But you are not quite done yet. There are couple of things you need to do before you can reset the root password. First, you need to remount the file system root in a read-write mode. Because we are early in a boot procedure, the root file system is mounted on a mount point with a name sysroot. And it's a read-only mount. In this command, it is making it read-write. Next, we need to make contents of sysroot the current root directory. And you do that by using ch root. And at this point, you can set the new password. You can do it by typing echo secret pipe password wd hyphen hyphen std in root. Now we are almost there. <coughs> but we also need to tell SC Linux that it needs to do an automatic relabeling. Because we are so early in the boot procedure. SC Linux is not being completely functional and if you don't do the touch of the dot auto relabel file your changes will get lost. Now type exit to get out of the root shell and another exit which will restart your system. This will take a while like 2 or 3 minutes that is normal and then you will get your login screen and now you can login as root with your new password. At the end, let's discuss the conclusion of this practical. First, you have entered in the grub menu while booting. Then find the line that starts with Linux 16 slash VM liners and add rd.break at the end of the line. Then it will take you to the root shell and here you have to type commands like mount minus o remount rw slash sysroot and so on. I hope by the time you know that how to reset the password for user root and that's it. Hi, welcome to part 2 of Vim text editor. Let's start with searching for a character. Suppose you want to search for character N, press escape F followed by the character you are looking for, which is N in this case. And your cursor search in forward direction of the line, press semicolon to move to the next N and then again semicolon and once it gets to the last end of the line it will stop functioning but again if you want to search in the backward direction you can use comma again and again but let's say you want to search a complete word in a file then you can use escape slash and just type the word you are looking for and to jump to the next search press n well, you can search for a word, but you can separate them from other words by highlighting your search results. To do that, use escape colon set hls and now search for anything like slash a. Now all a characters has been highlighted. To turn off this feature, you can use escape colon set no hls. Now, if you are using a text editor in graphical user interface environment, you can do things like highlight the text with your mouse and you can copy or delete that text. And if you are using Vim in a non-graphical environment, then you don't have the option of using the mouse. However, the Vim has the visual mode that behaves in a very similar way and in many cases, it's actually more powerful than simply using a graphical application that has a mouse support. Now let's see the demonstration of visual mode. There are three versions of visual mode. First is character wise visual mode, second is line wise visual mode and third is block wise visual mode. 
there are different commands to open different modes like lower case v to start character wise visual mode and upper case v to start line wise visual mode and control v to start block wise visual mode first i press v for visual mode you can verify by watching at lower left corner of this file now move your cursor either by using arrow keys or by pressing l again and again to select characters one after another or to get things done quickly you can press w for word you will notice that as i am moving my cursor the content gets highlighted after selecting or highlighting the text you can do anything with the highlighted content like you can delete it to delete type d and press u to undo the changes it is not always moved to the one direction like we use l to go in forward direction but we can also use h to highlight contents in the backward direction as well let's say you want to highlight contents both side of your cursor press 2w to select two words in the forward direction and then a lower case o which shifts your cursor to the other side of the highlighted content now press b which adds the previous word you can also select the complete paragraph at once to do that you have to use escape b a p a for all and p for paragraph now let's move to the line wise visual mode to start line wise visual mode use capital v or shift v and you will notice that even though your cursor was in the middle of a line the entire line was selected so the smallest selection you can make is one entire line in line wise visual mode again you can use motions to change that highlighted area the simplest motion is j to move your cursor down to the next line which makes that entire line become highlighted again no matter where your cursor ends up on a line that entire line would be selected in the line wise visual mode now if you perform any search like slash mr the entire line was highlighted press n for next and the whole line is highlighted because that's where the cursor ends up now if you use shift u it changes the whole context into upper case now there is a nice command gv which takes you to the last location of the visual mode no matter which of the visual mode you was using it will take you to the exact same position now let's talk about block wise visual mode press control v to enter into block wise visual mode and you can see visual block printed on the lower left side of the file which shows you that you are in block wise visual mode now move your cursor to the right and press escape j to take your cursor down and you will see a block has been selected unlike other two visual modes where it selects whole content but this one highlights contents in blocks well there is so much you can do it in visual mode some of the examples are use d to delete the highlighted content use c to change use i to insert or a for append or j to join upper case u to change case to upper case and small u for lower case and much more now let's talk about macros let's say you want to repeat a couple of commands the macros help you out with this in simple words you can use macros any time you have complex or new things added that needs to be repeated so let's get started vim macros are nothing more than a recorded sequence of keystrokes these keystrokes are actually stored in registers when you play back macro all the keystrokes that are recorded in registers are played back and it's exactly the same as if you were type those keystrokes again but there is a limitation of macro that is you cannot record a new macro in the existing one to start recording a macro use the q command followed by the register let's say you want to record a macro in a register type q a now you can see recording at a mentioned in the lower left part of the file let's press i and type some text the text i am typing doesn't make any sense and after typing it press q now the message of recording at a has been disappeared and your keystrokes has been saved to the specified register 
So let's have a look at A register by typing colon REGA and hit enter. You can see all the keystrokes I had used previously has been saved here including the I for insert and the escape key as well which is shown here as a caret and a bracket. Now you have a macro saved in the register A. You can play back this macro by simply using at A. At represents the symbol of at the rate. The quick way to replay the last macro is shift plus 2 and again 2 that is shift 2 2 that is equal to at the rate at the rate. You can print your recorded macro anywhere in the file. All you have to do is take your cursor to the position you want macro to be printed and then specify the register name like at the rate A in this case. Now let's make another macro and save it in register B. So Q B. Press O to place your cursor to the very beginning of the line and then I. Let's say you want to put a word hello at the beginning of each line. Type hello and press escape to get back to normal mode. Press J to move down to the next line. And now we can stop the recording by pressing Q. Let's replay our macro by using at B. You will notice that your cursor automatically moves to the next line. And if you press at at, it will do the same thing again. You can undo these changes by simply using U. Now let's say you want to repeat macro at 5 lines. So instead of using at at 5 times, you can use 5 at B. And that's it. One more thing I want to tell you is that you can add new keystrokes to an existing register. Let's say you want to add something to the B register. Well, in that case, use Q capital C. Press J and press Q. Open the register colon REG B and you can see that the last keystroke J has been added, which means you can append the register by using capital C. So this is part 3 of Vim text editor and in this part we will discuss about some of the Vim settings. Like you can configure Vim so that it appears with the same settings and options you wanted it to be open with each time. In Linux you have seen files with the name RC. Well. RC is the Unix or Linux convention. RC stands for run commands. So there is a Vim RC file. Each time you open Vim, it runs the commands in the Vim RC file. It is situated in the home directory with the name .vimrc. Before editing the Vim RC file, let's have a look on a colon set command, which is widely used in Vim. When you type colon set and hit enter, all the options that are set at something other than default are displayed. If you want to display value of an option, use colon set option name followed by a question mark. For example, let's say you want to know whether text highlighting option is enabled or not. You can use colon set HLS question mark and press enter. It displays no HL search indicating that the HL search option has been disabled. HLS is the short name for HL search. Now I am creating a Vim RC file for my user. So let me use colon E. E to edit. Tilde slash dot Vim RC. Tilde here represents the home directory of the current user. Although there are many options available to be used with Vim. You can see the list of all of them by typing colon H, option iPhone list and press enter. You can scroll down below to navigate through the options. To quit, press colon exit and then enter. Here I am using commonly used options. You can also view list of options by using colon options. Here you will see around 350 options with brief description. I am not going through all of them, so colon quit to exit. Now by default, history command has value of 50, which means that it can store up to 50 commands here. But I want to change this to 500. So set history is equal to 500. Press escape to return to normal mode. 
Here we use set without colon. Now let's check the value of history command by typing colon set history question mark. And you can see that the value I have set that is 500 is not applied yet. It is so because it will work when I open Vim again. So Vim tilde slash dot Vim RC. And again colon set history question mark. And yes it worked. Let's do something else. If you want your search results to be highlighted use set HL search. Then if you want that each line of a file contains a line number use set number. You can also take backup of a file by using set backup. Now save and exit the file and do ls minus a on tilde slash vim dot star. In the output you will see two files dot vimrc is your original file and vimrc tilde is the backup file. So this is how the backup function works in vim. <coughs> Open file again. You can tell Vim about what type of background you want to use. Like here, I use set bg is equal to light. And to see the immediate results, we use colon set bg is equal to light. And that's it. You can also specify Vim color scheme. First, let me show you all available color schemes for Vim. Colon color space control D. I like the default one personally. But if you want something different, you can use color space then specify the color name. Now there is another thing ruler. In Vim, the ruler can be enabled by typing colon set ruler. When enabled, the ruler is displayed on the right side of the status line at the bottom of the window. By default, it displays the line number, the column number, the virtual column number and the relative position of the cursor in the file. The ruler format can be set by using the ruler format command. Curiously, the default ruler format is empty even though it is displaying the specified details. You can find this out for yourself by typing colon set ruler format question mark. Our next topic is buffer. I don't know you are aware or not but you are using buffers all the time when you start using Vim. A buffer is an area of Vim's memory used to hold text read from a file. In addition to this, an empty buffer with no associated file can be created to allow the entry of text. The colon e file name command can edit an existing file or a new file. When a file is edited, the file is read into a new buffer that holds a temporary copy of the file. Editing makes changes to the buffer. To save a file, the original file is replaced by writing the buffer to disk. The caller new command creates a new window displaying the contents of a new buffer. To list all buffers use the colon ls command. Each buffer is assigned a number that is displayed in the first column. The second column describes the state of the buffer and the third column is the file name associated with the buffer. Let's try something else. Suppose you want to open multiple files at once. Vim xyz.txt abc.txt. Let's open one new file colon e sample.txt. We have opened three files in total, but we are not able to see the contents of all the files. To see buffers, use colon buffers. You can go through buffers help if you want by using colon h colon buffers and press enter. As you know you can use colon ls command to see buffers. Let's say you want to open file number 3 then use colon buffer 3 and hit enter. And to open buffer 2 use colon buffer space 2 and hit enter. And that's how it works. Now if you want to switch between buffers one by one like First you want to access buffer 1 and then buffer 2 and then 3. Type colon bn and enter. Colon bn and enter. bn stands for buffer next. Now if you want to switch between two buffers, let's say buffer 1 and 3. Then type colon bp and again colon bp. 
P. Use colon B F to go to buffer first and colon B L for buffer last. Now it's time for the exercise. I am giving you some questions based on all the lessons you have learned. I have divided exercise into three parts. This is exercise one. So the first question is. Describe three ways to open a terminal. Create a file with the name student using Vim and put some content. List first eight lines of etc pass wd file. List last five lines of etc shadow file. Copy the file student into slash etc directory. And create a folder with the name new folder. And then rename it as old folder. Vim is the most important topic for beginners. I have already explained what is Vim, how to create files using Vim, and basic features of Vim like cut, copy, paste. But now I am going to teach you about Vim in detail. I have divided Vim into three parts. This is part one. So let's begin. First, we talk about getting help. The easiest way. To ask for help is to start with executing colon help during a Vim session. This will drop you into the main help file, which has an overview of the basics. To get help with a specific command, we can provide that command as an argument to the colon help command. By invoking colon help space gg, we learn more details about gg command. We can use gg to jump at the top in a file. By default. The command we give to colon help is assumed to be a normal mode command. If we want to find commands that are used in other modes, we must use different conventions. For instance, if we run colon help u, we will find ourselves in the undo command section. In the normal mode, u will undo the latest change. But what does u do if we are in visual mode? To find out. We have to format our help command a bit differently. By running colon help v underscore u, we discover that u has drastically different behavior when invoked from visual mode. It transforms all the text in the visual selection to lower case. To get to the help for any command used in visual mode, we have to prepend v underscore to that command. The insert commands can be found by pretending i underscore to the command. For instance, colon help i underscore escape will tell us how the escape key will transition us from insert or replace mode into normal mode. The command line commands can be found by prepending colon to the command, just as we would do if we were invoking the command itself. The most obvious example is colon help space colon help. Regular expressions can be found by prepending slash to the character in question. For instance, if we type colon help slash backslash w, we will discover that backslash w, when used in a regex pattern, represents any word character. From there, we can browse through the other regex pattern. There are couple of additional conventions I didn't mention. You can see colon help help context for the whole picture. Now even with colon help at our disposal, there are going to be commands that we don't know by keyword and can't seem to find. Not to worry though. If we have an idea of what the command does, we should be able to track it down with colon help grep. It allows us to grab through our vim help files like you can try colon help grab space gg when we give colon help grab a search term it will look through all help files for occurrences of that term the end result is a list of locations that is file names and line numbers where that term appears vim will put this list in the quick fix list for our convenience let's look at an example we want to do a substitution throughout an entire file but we cannot remember all the details we can try searching colon help substitution to no avail being not sure of how else to get there we can lean on colon help grep by invoking colon help grep 
substitution, we get a big list of places where the word substitution occurs in the help files. If we pop open the quick fix list with colon C open, we see all the places that the word substitution shows up. Now you can navigate around it if you want. Let's do something else. Let's say you have a couple of lines in a group of two, like line number 1 and 2 has to be same and line number 3 and 4 must be same, but now they aren't. So you can do it in two ways. Either you can press J and then W, W to navigate and then I to insert and type A and then line in order to make them same. Now this is the method you already know. So let's move to another line that is line number 5 and do that by pressing J three times or you can use 3J. Suppose you want to make this line same as line number 4. Now press Shift I. The cursor jumps on first non blink character in the file and you placed into insert mode. This is the same thing as pressing caret and I. So the lowercase i command lets you insert text before your current cursor position and capital I lets you insert text before the first non-blink character on a line you are on. To make this line just like the above it, you can just type capital H E L L O and then press escape to return back to normal mode. Now let's move down to the line G O D morning and you can do that by using 3J and then press shift I to go to the beginning of the line. Now let's say you want G-O-D to read good, G-O-O-D. You can move a cursor over a character and can use the I command for insert mode or you can simply press the A command from your cursor position and as you press A, what happens is that the command appends text after the current cursor position. So to fix this mistake, we press A as I did and add O to fix our mistake. Press escape to return to normal mode and we are all set. Now let's again move to the next pair of lines by pressing 3J. Now this line is missing the last word. So you can use the capital A command which appends to the end of the line and type P A R W -E K and press escape to get back to command mode. You can create a new line just below the cursor and get into insert mode both by simply pressing small o from your keyboard or to create a new line just above the cursor press shift plus o that is capital O. Let's say you want to create a line of asterisk. Press 6 0 and then i to get into insert mode. Make an edit by pressing shift and 8 to enter an asterisk. And now when you press escape, that command is repeated 60 times in your left with the line of 60 asterisks right there. Now let's say you want to create 5 lines that starts with hash. Well, for this press escape 5 O. Now you placed in the insert mode. Hit the hash sign here and then press escape. This might be a quick way to create comment section for a file or for a shell script. Well, you can use this command to print more characters like if you want to print good morning at the starting of 10 lines then you can use escape 10 o type good morning and then again escape and that's it. Now let's get into the replace mode by using shift plus r. Now as I type hello it will replace hi with hello. This is what a replace mode do. Let's say you want to change only a character and not the whole word or line. Like in our next example, you want to replace small m of morning with capital M. As you are in replace mode, take your cursor to that position and type capital M. And that's it. Now, let's say you want to change a complete line into uppercase. Press escape and then G, shift U, U and to convert a line into lower case, press G, U, U. But in some case, you don't want to change a complete line into uppercase or lowercase. 
instead you want to convert a single word into upper case and into lower case like in our example hello world you want to convert hello in upper case and world into lower case to do that press escape g shift u and then w for word and to convert world into lower case press escape g u w before ending this tutorial i want to tell you one more important command and that is capital j command capital j command join lines together we have hi good morning mr expert so press escape shift j you can see the two lines has been joined with an space at the end of the first line but what if you want to join two lines but without any space well in that case you can use escape g shift j that is capital j and that's it in our next example we are going to join three lines to do that press escape 3 and capital j so the first question is describe three ways to open a terminal okay first is simply right click and select open in terminal second navigate to applications then utilities and click on terminal to open it third is press super user key or window key from keyboard and type terminal and hit enter our second question is to create a file with the name student and add some content using vim so vim student press i for insert and type your matter like i am a student now save the file using escape call and wq and enter that's it third question is to list first eight lines of slash etc pass wd file so head minus n 8 slash etc pass wd or you can also use head minus 8 on slash etc pass wd both are same our fourth question is to list last five lines of etc shadow file so tail minus n 5 slash etc slash shadow our fifth question is to copy the file student in slash etc directory so cp student slash etc our last question is create a folder with name new folder so mk dir new folder and then it ask you to change this folder name to old folder so mv new folder old folder to verify use ls command and that's all this is exercise 2 create the following users groups and group memberships a group named sysadmin a user tom who belongs to sysadmin as a secondary group a user jerry who also belongs to sysadmin as a secondary group a user harry who does not have access to an interactive shell on the system and who is not a member of sysadmin assign password to all the users and the password would be user at the rate 1 2 3 create a directory slash common slash admin with the following characteristics group ownership of slash common slash admin is sysadmin the directory should be readable writable and accessible to members of sysadmin but not to any other user files created in slash common slash admin automatically have group ownership set to the sysadmin group then The user Jerry must configure a cron job that runs daily at 14:23 and executes slash bin echo hello. Next, copy the file etc fs tab to where temp and configure the permissions of where temp fs tab so that the file fs tab is owned by the root user. The file fs tab belong to the group root. The file fs tab should not be executable by anyone the user natasha is able to read and write where temp fs tab and the user sara can neither write nor read where temp fs tab note all other users current or future have the ability to read where temp fs tab
our first question is to create users groups and group memberships so first point is to create a group sys admin group add sys admin then it ask you to create three users with different characteristics so user add minus capital g sys admin tom see i don't want to repeat the questions as you already have them in the previous lecture so i am focusing on the answers then user add minus g sys admin jerry next user add minus s for shell slash s bin no login harry and pass wd tom enter password for user tom and again repeat it and pass wd jerry enter password and then pass wd harry and assign the password Our next question is to create a directory slash common slash admin with mentioned characteristics. So ad I advise you to first go through the complete question and then watch this video further to get solution. So mkdir minus p minus p is for parent directory slash common slash admin. Then use chgrp sys admin slash common slash admin. Next ch mode. Two seven seven zero slash common slash admin. In the third question, it asks you to configure a cron job. So su hyphen jerry cron tab hyphen e twenty three fourteen star star star. Then slash bin slash echo space hello. Save and exit by using escape colon wq. To verify, use cron tab. Minus L. Our last question of this exercise is to copy the specified file and configure different permissions. So, cp slash etc slash fstab to where temp. Then user add Natasha. Next user add Sarah. Then set facl minus m u colon Natasha colon rw hyphen on Slash where temp fs tab. Next, set facl minus m u colon sarah colon hyphen 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 on slash where temp fs tab. It is understood that by default root is the user owner and group owner of slash where slash temp slash fs tab. So we don't need to do anything. Welcome to exercise three. Create a new partition and mount it under slash common, and it has size of 400 megabyte and use ext4 file system. Then create a user neo with uid 1337 and set the password password. Find the string root from slash etc slash passwd file and save the result in slash search file. Next. Create a backup dot tar dot bz2 of slash etc directory in slash home location. As per question number one, we have to create a partition. So f disk slash dev slash sdb, press n, enter, enter, enter. Define last sector as plus 400 capital M. Press p. If all okay, press w. part probe then mkfs.ext4 on slash dev slash sdb with your partition number then mkdir slash common then mount slash dev slash sdb1 space slash common and to verify use df hyphen h next question is to create neo with uid 1337 so user add minus u 1337 neo third question grep root slash etc slash passwd greater than slash search file and the last is tar so tar cbfj backup dot tar dot bz2 slash etc that's all for the exercise As the name suggests we are going to try something funny in Linux 
but it is useful too. First is reverse or rev command. It reverses every string given to it. Isn't it funny? Like rev and then one two three or Linux or one two three ABC. Next is factor command. This command output all the possible factors of a given number, like factor space five, or factor six, or factor one zero zero one, etc. Next command is yes command. It is funny but useful as well, especially in scripts, where an automated predefined response can be passed to terminal, like yes, I love Linux. It continues until you press Control C to interrupt. Next is try to run it. I have just copy and paste the command. You can try it by typing. And observe the output. It tells you that it is missing. At last, I want to tell you about a dangerous command. You can call it a fork bomb. It's a very nasty piece of code. It exponentially multiplies itself till all the system resources is utilized and the system hangs but run it at your own risk i show you how it works so colon bracket open and close and then curly braces colon pipe colon ampersand bracket close semicolon and then colon and now you have to believe me I am trying to use keyboard and mouse but they are not working at all. And that's it for this tutorial. In this lesson I will teach you how you can configure Apache web server on your own Linux system. Right? Now I hope you know that majority of the websites in the world are running on Apache web server and Apache web server is based on Linux. So it is used for the purpose of website hosting. It provides you simple and secure access to all of the contents and Apache web server uses HTTP protocol. So the package name for Apache is HTTPD and it uses port number 80 for HTTP and for HTTPS it use port number 443. So let's install all of the packages for Apache. So HTTPD and star but this won't work here right now the reason behind is that it says yum is not enabled okay so we have to configure yum now what is yum yum is a tool which help you to install or modify or update packages in red hat enterprise linux right so first of all we have to configure some repos repo stands for repositories so let's do that first so let's move to the etc and then yum.repos.d okay there is no file here so let's create a new one and let's say rel.repo okay but before doing this we have to copy all of the contents from red hat enterprise linux dvd to our own system so for that First of all, we have to mount DVD in this system. So this is my virtual machine. Let's go to settings, go to storage. And in here, we have to add the ISO file. Click on OK. Done. Right. Now, open with files. OK, we have to open this DVD here and let's copy all of these folders to our machine okay so let's copy it copy and let's paste it to let's say downloads folder okay so create a new folder name it rel okay and now paste all of the content here right now it will take some time to copy the whole content as it is approximately 3.8 gigs right so i have to pause this video and i will resume once the process gets completed
So now the process has been completed. Let's close this dialog box. Okay. Now let's create the file. So the name would be rel dot repo, right? Now, first of all, you have to press I for insert. Okay. Then as mention the name of the repository. Then comes the base URL. Okay. So right now I am using all of the packages uh, on my own machine. All right. But if you have any other server which contains all of these packages, then you can use FTP and then the IP address of that server. But for now, as I am using uh, my own machine for all purposes, so I will use file colon slash slash, right? Now the path of the repository, which is slash root slash downloads slash rel. Okay. Now enabled is equal to one and GPG check is equal to now GPG check will help us to authenticate the repository. Okay. So I will use zero to disable it. If you want to enable this, you can use one, but for now leave it to zero and save the file and exit. Okay. Done. Yum clean all. Okay. Uh, let's ignore this message. And now yum repo list. Okay, so it's working now, right? Now, first of all, we have to install a package called as VSFTPD, right? After configuring yum, you have to install this package and then uh, after completing this package, we will install HTTPD, okay, which is the package for Apache web server. So I will explain the further steps in the next video. So installation has been completed for VSFTPD. Now VSFTPD stands for very secure FTP daemon and it comes under general public license. Actually, it is an FTP server for Linux operating system. Okay, so let's install our Apache packages. So yum hyphen y install httpd and star. Okay, star means include all of the packages and yum would help you to install all of the dependencies and other libraries which is required. Okay, so it will take some time. So let's pause the video. So the installation has been completed and now let's start the service. So system CTL, which means system controller start HTTPD. Okay. And now let's enable the service. Now what's the difference between start and enable? See if you start any service and uh, whenever you reboot the system or you start the system again, the service won't work. So to make it permanent, we use enable. Okay. Done. Now we have to allow this service in firewall rules. Okay. So we have to add a new firewall rule regarding this service. Otherwise firewall uh, stop this service from working properly. So let's use firewall hyphen CMD hyphen hyphen permanent okay hyphen hyphen add hyphen service is equal to http now firewall hyphen cmd hyphen hyphen reload done okay now we have our Apache web server ready. If you want to test it, open the browser and enter the IP address of this machine. Okay. But for now, 
I will type the IP of localhost. Okay, so let's try this. And one twenty seven dot o dot o dot one. Hit enter, and you will able to see the default page. Okay, now if you host any website here, you will able to see that. Okay, and the path, the by default directory for Apache is this. Which is a slash where www and HTML. Okay, so let's do that. Let me close this first. So close tabs. Okay, now let's move to where www and HTML. Ls. Okay, there is nothing here. so let's create a new file that is index.html okay hit enter enter any matter you want like hello world save the file suppose this is your web page okay so let's again open the browser and try the same thing again okay so 127 dot 1 see okay so this is your website right so you can create new pages or you can paste already created web pages here in where www html So I hope now you know how you can configure Apache web server on your own machine. So here is the list of all the basic commands that I will cover during this course. See, it's approximately uh, 30 commands or more. So I am not going to cover all of these commands in a single video because it will make a video longer. so we will give it a break here right so let's see the remaining commands uh, we have learned mkdir to create a folder then we have learned rmdir to remove the folder then we have learned remove recursive and forcefully now if in future it is required to delete any folder or any file we will going to use this command rm space hyphen rf okay we will not going to use rmdir right so make a habit of using this command now let's start with our next command that is clear okay uh, this is just to clear the all of the remain uh, about commands from the terminal okay it is same like cls command in uh, command prompt in your windows operating system let's see the next command now you know how to use mkdir command now let's try some examples suppose you want to create three different folders on the same location then mkdir and the three folders uh, let's say a b and c so a space b space c right now let's check on the desktop see all three are created okay in the same way you can remove these as well either use rmdir or rm hyphen rf a space b space and c okay now suppose you want to create another three folders but not on the desktop okay but inside one another for example you want to create a folder 1 on desktop okay and then inside one you want to create another folder let's say 2 and inside 2 you want to create a folder 3 okay so for this use mkdir hyphen p p for parent and then 1 slash 2 slash 3 okay now how does this command works when we use hyphen p option then uh, it will directly jump to create a folder 3 okay but before creating 3 it will check whether folder 2 exist or not okay and for that it will check uh, folder 1 exist or not 
if it exists then it's okay it will create the remaining folders okay but if it is not then it will create the folder itself okay so press enter and let's check it on desktop so one open one we will find two okay open folder two and we will get folder three right now let's repeat the command see guys this whole line is not a command the command is the first word okay so mkdir is the command hyphen p is the option which is available to be used with this command and then there is argument okay so this single line consists of three different things first is command then option and the last is argument okay now let's see our next command uh, which is pwd okay so pwd stands for present working directory okay that is print working directory okay so if we run pwd it will going to print our current working directory okay so our current working directory is slash root slash desktop see guys everything in linux is under slash okay you can assume slash as a my computer okay so every file every folder every data is comes under slash now uh, let's move on our next command which is ls that is list show it will list out all the directories and files present on the current working directory okay for now there is only one folder that is one okay now the other command is ll that is long list it will provide uh, the list of files and folders along with all the details like this d denotes the directory and the other nine are permissions okay then there is the name of the owner of the directory which is root and then there is group owner name then there is date and time okay now either you can use ll or you can use ls hyphen l both will perform the same function right now let's see our next command which is cd okay cd is very important command cd stands for change directory okay it help us to navigate from one location to another okay let's say we want to go to slash root so simply press cd slash root okay see guys we can use tab button for auto completion okay hit enter and now we are under slash root okay we are under the home directory of user root now let's check the folders and files here so the blue ones are the folders and the black ones are the files okay now let's run double l c okay uh, so first character if it is d then it denotes directory if it is hyphen it denotes file now leave the permissions for now we will study them later okay let's clear the screen either you can use clear command or you can simply press control l okay control l is the shortcut for clear command let's see our next command uh, so we have some different functions of cd command okay so if we use cd space single dot so single dot represents the current directory so we are giving instructions that uh, change directory to current directory so nothing happens right now let's move back to desktop okay now let's try cd space dot dot double dot represents parent directory okay which will take you one step back so let's use it and ls c okay use pwd we are in slash root so slash root is the parent directory for uh, slash desktop okay now 
there is one more command that is cd space hyphen it will take us to the last location okay so we are in slash root if we press enter we go back to desktop which is our last location now if we run again then it will take us to slash root because slash root is our last location so it will switch between the two locations okay from point a to point b and then from point b to again point a now let's see our next command so it is date command okay date and log name host name right now if you type date and hit enter it will show you the current date and time okay and if you use a cal command it stands for calendar then it will show you the current month's calendar right now uh, the next command is log name that is login name it will show you that from which user we have logged in so currently we have logged in from root user right now next command is host name that is your machine name which is by default set to localhost dot local domain okay we can change this using the host name ctl command okay but for now leave it to default and let's move to our next command okay hyphen h see guys at any point of time if you want help regarding any command just mention the name of the command let's say mkdm and use hyphen h you can use hyphen h or you can use hyphen hyphen help okay but hyphen h is easy okay so it says invalid option so we have to use hyphen hyphen help okay so it will give us a summary of all the available options which we can use with mkdir command right so it shows use uh, this is the format use mkdir then mention options then your arguments okay so suppose we want to know the version of this command okay so let's type mkdir hyphen hyphen version okay it says 8.22 and it comes under gpl version 3 gpl stands for general public license okay as you know that linux is open source now let's move to our next command next command is touch so if you use touch command it will create a blank file okay so let's say touch student right so it has created a blank file with the name student on desktop okay uh, no no not on desktop our current location is under slash root let's check ls and uh, see the student file is now been created okay and to remove a file we will use rm remove command okay and then the name of the file let's verify it it says a regular empty file remove yes see guys we have used rm command uh, that's why it ask us the question that do you want to remove this file but if we use rm space hyphen rf then it will not going to ask any single question okay it will delete the file forcefully right now Uh, we will cover the remaining commands in the next video